Hello, everyone. So, I'm going to open this up. Uh, I just want to say good afternoon, and on behalf of the Marketing and Advertising Club, we would like to welcome you to this year's Summit for Marketing and Advertising Careers. My name is Mehdi Aruji, and I am the president of the Marketing and Advertising Club. And I want to thank you for coming, and I am so excited to see such a great turnout for our event. I would like to extend a thank you to all of our guest speakers who have traveled here to share their knowledge and experience with us here today. We will be hearing from industry leaders from L.L. Bean, Red Bull, Easter Steels, Small Army, Riddle and Bloom, Hershey, Chewy, Tenuity, and Wayfair. This event could not happen without you all, and we are so grateful that you, you are here with us today. Next, I want to recognize Max Board of Directors. When I say your name, please stand up and just wave to the crowd. Uh, we're going to start with our Vice President, Amanda Zubricki. Next, Lexi Houghton, Director of Events. <laughs> Abigail Tetro, Director of the Chapter of the American Marketing Association. <laughs> Kamal Waru, Director of Marketing. <laughs> he just walked in in the back. Uh, next up is Lily Scott, our Treasurer. We've got Maddie Schatzer, the secretary. And last but not least, we've got Zach Cladaris, director of development. Also, we would like to thank our amazing student ambassadors and AMA team who are helping with this event as well. Throughout the year, we are especially leading up to the event. The team has been working hard to make sure our members have the best possible experience with the club. Additionally, we would like to thank Diane Devine, a faculty sponsor, who continued success as a club is greatly attributed to you. We want to thank you for everything you do for Matt. <laughs> we would also like to thank our Dean, Deborah Merrill Sands, our marketing department chair, Tom Gruen, along with Teresa Cherevi and Paul College's faculty and staff, especially Tom Trella, Kevin Poliquin, and Sherry Cannon. Once again, thank you for all your help and support with this year's MaxMac. This event is made possible thanks to the Peter T. Paul Innovation Fund, the Dean's Office, and the Marketing Department. We are pleased to present a full schedule of events. We just wrapped up an amazing round of the Real World Business Challenge. We also hosted a career in professional services along with a number of recruiting companies. We are currently here at the keynote presentation with Sean Gorman, which we will start soon, but right after we will host a panel of marketing professionals from 2 to 3 p.m., and then starting at 3, we'll present our next panel of recent Paul College alumni. Starting at 4 p.m., we will open up with a networking reception in the Great Hall and announce the winners of the Real World Business Challenge. Now, I am pleased to introduce this year's keynote speaker and UNH alum, Sean Gorman. Sean serves as executive chairman of L.O. Bean, a family-owned outdoor retailer that was founded by his great-grandfather, Leon, Leon Wood Bean, in Freeport, Maine in 1912. Sean's been instrumental in growing L.O. Bean and his various leadership roles, including developing its e-commerce, B2B, credit card business, as well as integrating L.O. Bean's brand strategies across its mail, web, and retail channels to ensure consistency and customer focus. As executive chairman, he leads the board of directors, oversees the company's audit and board compensation committees, and is a member of L.O. Bean's governance committee. So please welcome Sean Gorman. Thank you, Betty. Appreciate it. Hi, everybody. It's a good day to be a Wildcat. Um, I'm excited to be here for, for several reasons. Um, but before I get started, I understand it's tradition. I don't know if this is true or not, or someone's setting me up. But to determine, or the presenter has to determine which pub is their favorite in town. Is it Libby's or Sports? Is that really a tradition? Okay. <laughs> Well, I'd have to say Libby's, but I'm so old. When I went here, it was called Nick's, and Mike Libby used to work the door at, at, at Nick's. So uh, I'd have to say it's, it's uh, Nick's, Libby's. Um, as a proud UNH alum, um, any chance I get back to come back to Durham is, uh, is good for me, and uh, I love the opportunity to rejoin my Wildcat family today. 
Um, also, after such an incredibly long stretch of virtual meetings, I'm so glad to be presenting physically and not via webcam. It's so much better. And lastly, as a marketer, um, by heart and by trade, I'm eager to talk about L.L. Bean and what it means to be a purpose-driven brand. Um, my hope for today is that my presentation won't feel like a presentation, but rather like a story um, about my family's company that was founded more than 110 years ago by my great-grandfather. Um, so in the spirit of storytelling, I'll start from the beginning. Most people know Leon Leon with Bean, who he was, and that he was the founder of L.L. Bean and uh, the creator of the main hunting shoe, also known as the Bean Boot, which remains our most popular and iconic product today. Um, but what many people uh, don't know is why L.L. Bean started his company in the first place. And the answer is really quite simple. L.L. was a lifelong outdoorsman. He spent much of his time outside tramping around the, uh, the main woods, hunting and fishing. And uh, these pursuits continued well into his adulthood, but it was at the age of 40 when he started his company. A lot of people don't know that. And he decided he was fed up with coming back from his hunting trips with cold, wet feet. So um, as a fellow New Englanders, I think we can all relate. Um, the weather changes pretty often in New England, and more often than not, it's cold and damp. So his quest to solve this problem, how to keep his feet warm and dry, led him to create the main hunting shoe, uh, an innovative product designed to bring comfort to he and fellow outdoor enthusiasts so they could spend more time outside no matter the conditions. One of his earliest catalogs, geared uh, to main hunting and fishing license holders, said you can't expect to uh, hunt deer or moose if your feet are not properly dressed. The main hunting shoe is designed by a hunter who has tramped the main woods for the past 28 years. They are as light as a pair of moccasins with the protection of heavy hunting boots. LL's clever but straightforward copy took hold with his fellow outdoorsmen and soon orders for his main hunting shoes started to roll in. This was really fueled by his promise of 100% satisfaction. Unfortunately, about 90 of the first 100 pair he sold were returned because the rubber bottoms separated from the leather tops. Um, for any small business, this could prove to be disastrous, a big setback like that. But LL kept his word, um, and he refunded all those early orders. And it did nearly put him out of business, but he persevered. He borrowed $400 from his brother. He perfected his design using the triple stitch that we now see in the boot today. And... Um, he sent out more flyers, and the rest is history. And this was the start um, of uh, LL's purpose-driven brand. We fast forward to today. The company has changed greatly since LL's time. Here are a few highlights. Um, LL Bean is an omni-channel outdoor brand with customers all over the world, including uh, we just surpassed 8 million email subscribers, which is a pretty big deal. Um, we remain family-owned and privately held. We, um, we've just crossed into our sixth generation. My, uh, my brother's daughter, my niece, just had a child. So um, we're into the sixth generation of family ownership. In addition to our direct-to-consumer business, we have 55 retail stores throughout the U.S. We also operate stores and independent websites in both Japan and Canada. Um, we just closed the books on fiscal 2021. Um, happy to say we saw record-setting numbers in both sales and profitability, and this was on record-setting numbers we saw last year in 2020. Uh, I hate to say that the pandemic had its advantages, but it certainly helped the outdoor industry and us. Um, we have about 5,000 year-round employees. That number doubles during the holiday time to, to handle our holiday volume. And I'm uh, really proud to share that uh, just last week, Forbes ranked us number 35 on their um, top businesses, top mid-sized businesses in the country, and we were number two in the um, apparel and equipment category. And while the company has changed a great deal in our 110-year history, our fundamental principles remain. Um, L.O. Bean is a values-driven organization. We operate by a set of core values, uh, respect, service, integrity, perseverance, outdoor heritage, and safe and healthy living. Additionally, we're really proud uh, to function under a stakeholder philosophy, and you hear a lot of people talking about stakeholder philosophies now, but ours was uh, created by my uncle Leon. He ran the company for nearly 40 years, and he's credited with really turning L.L. Bean into the global outdoor brand that we are today. As a stakeholder organization, we don't uh, define success purely by financial results, but rather by how well we meet the needs of all of our stakeholders, and these include employees, customers, communities, vendors, our shareholders, and the natural environment. We 
have a really strong culture at LL Bean stemming from our shared love of the outdoors, commitment to living our core values, and in honoring LL's golden rule of treating people like human beings. These tenets that LL created, Leon codified, are now in my generation's hands to ensure that LL Bean continues to operate as a purpose-driven brand. So that's a bit of company history. The next part of the story highlights our ongoing brand and, and purpose journey. When I joined LL Bean in 1991, we were at a little bit of a crossroads. We were in the midst of um, launching our Japan business, and we were just coming off about a 20-year run of really great sales, fueled by two trends, this kind of back to the woods trend in the 1970s, and then the preppy boom that a lot of you remember uh, from the 1980s. And while this period resulted in really strong and loyal uh, customers, um, it's also a time when our product strategy started to shift a little bit. We began focusing on developing products uh, to meet the needs of this existing customer base and shifted away from products that were probably more outdoor oriented or should have been products that were developed for a company and the brand and what we stood for. And as owners, we were uh, a little bit concerned that um, the family business was becoming better known for its khakis than its outdoor gear. Um, and even though the company remained profitable at that time, I feared that the strategy would hurt us in the long run. And as the years rolled on, that's exactly what happened. Um, sales growth became a significant challenge. We were getting all our growth by introducing products, not by gathering new customers. So you had an existing base and you're just offering them more. And as we offered more, we were diluting the brand a little bit. Additionally, with such a large product assortment and continued focus on that um, fixed and aging set of customers, our cost structure was really out of whack and uh, profits declined pretty significantly. So we, we needed to make some big changes. Fortunately, uh, it wasn't too late to return to our roots and get back to what we had always stood for and do it in a way that would resonate with uh, today's consumer. The first step was really developing a, a new merchandising strategy uh, to reprioritize our outdoor-oriented offerings and phase out more refined products uh, that were counter to what you'd expect from uh, an outdoor brand. We were selling pinpoint ostrich and blazers and penny loafers. Uh, it doesn't really jive with LLB, I don't think. Um, so shifting our product focus, though, it took a lot of time. You know, we didn't get up to a place of, of um, non-relevance overnight, and I knew we wouldn't get back to a place of relevance overnight either. These, these are big trends that take time to move. So we started this shift more than a decade ago. And just as importantly, tackling our product, uh, as, as tackling our product strategy, or strategy we, um, it really helped prepare us for the really meaningful brand shift that uh, we'd make a few years later. When we started this brand journey, it presented us with some pretty hard truths. Research shows that many consumers, especially those outside of New England, um, didn't associate LL Bean with the outdoors. Um, and people had either not heard of our brand um, or the younger folks associated LL Bean with things that their parents or maybe even worse, their grandparents uh, wore. Um, for those who did know us, LL Bean didn't resonate that strongly with the outdoors either, while brands like with a singular clarity like a Patagonia or a North Face really had stronger brand loyalty. I attribute our lack of outdoor relevance um, during those years from us developing products for that existing customer base, as I said. Uh, over time, the outdoors have become less prominent and in our products and in our brand story, and that was a big problem. If there's one hard um, and fast rule that I've learned over the years about marketing, it's uh, if the consumer doesn't see themselves in your product, you're going to have a really hard time selling it to them. So um, with a talented in-house team, along with a great advertising partner in Portland, Maine, um, we launched our brand, or relaunched our brand in the spring of 2017 with the Be an Outsider tagline. And um, with a, it features a great play on the word bean, and we also reveal the new brand positioning statement. So uh, the Be an Outsider campaign is terrific. Um, and our, our um, new slogan was LL Bean made for the shared joy of the outdoors. And uh, which underscores our commitment to make purpose, uh, purposeful products to enable people to enjoy being outside. And by now, our new merchandise strategy had been in full swing for, for quite some time. Our merchant team had eliminated hundreds of products. Uh, we reduced our SKU count, uh, stock keeping unit count, by 50% during this time, and we really doubled down on products um, that were in our active, rugged, and casual categories and kind of felt aligned with our lifestyle brand. 
And uh, I may not be the most um, objective L.L. Bean product ambassador, but I can say that our products have never looked and functioned better, and they haven't ever been more relevant to our consumer. And I would say that as we continue to see growth in brand awareness, um, as more people comment, uh, excuse me, connect with Be An Outsider, um, it's really great because it's the way we're presenting ourselves is it's really easy to be an outsider and, and to, partic to participate and just get outside. It doesn't have to be a great adventure. But as it turned out, the successful launch of our, of our new brand positioning and adjusting our products to be more in line with what we wanted them to be um, with the outdoors was only the beginning. We really had um, an important and related piece of work that we need to focus on next, and that was to reaffirm our purpose. So what do I mean when I say reaffirming Ella Bean's purpose? It's, um, well, for me, purpose states why a company exists. And our reason for being, the reason we exist, is to inspire and enable people to experience the restorative power of being outside. There's a lot built into that sentence. I won't go into it today, but we specifically don't say outdoors because people think outdoors is big. Literally outside, like stepping out into your backyard is okay with us. Um, to be clear, this journey was not about recreating our purpose. Our purpose has been firmly in place for over a century, but our challenge was more of a language one. Uh, more specifically, the words we used to describe L.L. Bean's purpose existed in multiple forms and none actually articulating the why. It was always about inspiring and enabling people to get outside, but we never said why. And although we've been always about inspiring and enabling people, um, the problem was um, uh, that when you have something as important, as important as your reason for being, you better be able to answer that and articulate that pretty clearly. It should be crystal clear for everybody in your organization. So we saw an opportunity to formally answer this question. So why does Ella Bean exist? Well, through a series of interviews with members of the family, our executive team, leaders, customers, we learned a lot. Um, we did learn that we were 100% aligned on the physical and emotional benefits of spending time outside. Just as both LL and Leon had um, addressed at different moments in their lives, um, such as this famous quote from LL, I love this quote. He said, to my mind, hunting and fishing is the big lure that takes us into the great open spaces and teaches us to forget the mean and petty things in life. And that's a super relevant quote for today. Um, and years later, my uncle Leon wrote it this way. He said, we share our customers' belief in the value of the outdoor experience, of the physical and spiritual rewards that come from participating in outdoor activities. And I have to play here too, so I often describe it this way, which I say there's an undeni un undeniable restorative effect of spending time outside. Whenever I find myself um, kind of getting out of balance from the stress of this hyper-competitive, tech-driven world, um, I simply unplug and recharge by stepping outside and watching nature go about its business. There is that natural order of things, and no matter how chaotic they are, step outside and watch some nature go on, it's going at a nice orderly pace. It'll calm you. And um, we saw these related themes emerging from this work, too, this, these purpose interviews. Everyone started using words to describe time outside with re, these re words. Um, they were saying that they noted feeling recharged, renewed, reset, reflected, refocused, um, rejuvenated, and restored. And these words suggest that the outdoors uh, provides us all with something really powerful in terms of our physical and emotional well-being. Words that help us define why L.L. Bean exists. So our next step was to look at the marketplace and see how other outdoor brands were defining their connections to the outdoors. And we discovered something uh, pretty cool there, too. Um, so here we plotted several brands um, on this grid where you have Topic, um, which is planet to people running along the horizontal axis, and Tome, from advancement to activism running vertically. Bear in mind, we're all outdoor brands and we're all going kind of after the same thing here within a fairly tight window. But even within that window, there are differences and we need to find the white space that we play in. And um, for example, a brand like Patagonia, a uh, really strong planet first activist approach, while brands like North Face and REI um, fall more in the middle. And we found our spot that we were much more of a people-first advancement brand. And this hardly means that Elevine doesn't care about the planet. Um, 
you know, the natural environment is one of our key stakeholders that we that I stated earlier. So it's super important. But we do believe that by focusing on people and their enjoyment of the outdoors, we're going to help them to become better stewards of the environment. And we think that's going to have a, a, a longer term effect. Uh, and that would be great for the planet. So this is the significant brand differentiator for us. And again, um, there was opportunity for us to go there and differentiate ourselves against some of our competitive set. So with our purpose statement in hand, it was time to think about how we elevate and activate it with our stakeholders, both internally and externally. I'll start with some of our external efforts um, and the opportunity we saw to help people understand the connection to time spent outdoors and our collective well-being. Um, just as LL knew instinctively about the benefits of being outside, um, there's now science to back this up. It's called the science of awe, uh, and it's a real thing. <laughs> um, and for a bit of context, um, experiencing awe in nature um, isn't just about like these multi-day adventures or grand trips to national parks um, uh, or huge adventures in the backcountry. You know, there's nothing against those solo conquerors hanging from their fingers from a cliff in Yosemite, all the power to you, but that's not who we're trying to reach. Um, the idea behind the science of awe is that all moments in nature, even micro moments, um, have an important and lasting effects on our physical and emotional well-being. So as the, um, as the brand that believes in the shared value, uh, shared joy of the outdoors, we saw this as a, a really important um, differentiator and important step in our purpose journey. So we teamed up with a, uh, a Dr. Paul Pip, who is an expert in the science of art, and we funded some research in this emerging field. Um, as part of our efforts to prepare for Mental Health Awareness Month, which is coming up in May, uh, we'll start to share some of Dr. Piff's research and uh, some of those findings about the impact that spending time outside had on adults during the pandemic and uh, with regard to their overall well-being. Since launching our purpose back in, or I should say relaunching our purpose back in, in May of 19, in 2020, we've just seen phenomenal response and, uh, and results. Our simple messaging about finding joy in the outdoors resonated with customers in those early months of the pandemic as they turned to LL Bean and the outdoors for respite. Additionally, we published um, several op-eds uh, in national publications about the benefit of spending time outside. And these were complemented by really great catalog, advertising, and social media content, along with efforts to um, expand our commitment to nonprofit outdoor partners like uh, the Trust for Public Land and the National Park Foundation. This purpose-related content generated billions of impressions, media impressions, which really helped us drive uh, more people to the outdoors and, frankly, more people to LL Bean to help them get outside. This year, we're, um, we're 21, we really focused on taking all the purpose work we did in 20 and turning it up a notch. This included more actively aligning our charitable giving with our purpose through several new partnerships. Um, this includes the National Wildlife Federation, Boys and Girls Club of America, and Out There Adventures. And we're partnering with these um, organizations to develop programming to get kids and families outside with a particular focus on, um, on people with limited access to the outdoors to ensure that the outdoors is accessible and welcoming to everyone. So that's a, a bit of our external efforts uh, around purpose. Now I want to share what we've been doing internally and how we've been talking about purpose within the walls of LLB. Because if you're not aligned with your external efforts, um, you're not going to be successful if you're not aligned internally. So this next slide, um, I love this slide, but I developed this kind of business framework um, a few years back to help us kind of really put structure around our business planning process. And this is our core business framework uh, that shows our evergreen tenants on the left side starting with purpose, mission, and guiding principles, and then moving to the right towards elements that evolve over time, like your vision, your long-range goals, and then your annual goals. I love this slide both for its simplicity and its richness. Um, it shows in one view all that LL Bean is about, uh, and that everything we do starts with and ladders back to our purpose, why we exist. Then as you move to the right, it's followed by our mission, what we do, which is sell quality products to help people enjoy the outdoors. Then over to our guiding principles, how we operate, which is all about our values and stakeholder philosophy. Once again, the tenants on the left never change, they're evergreen. 
Um, but as we move to the right, we start moving into Vision, which has become the leading outdoor brand for everyone. We just established this. This is a long, long-term vision. But we want L.L. Bean to be the first and only outdoor brand people think of when they want to spend time outside and think of a company that's committed to ensuring that the outdoors is welcoming and accessible for everyone. From our vision, we then move to what um, changes the most on this framework, and that's our multi-year plan or a three to five year plan and our annual goals. And these are set specifically to ensure that we're on track to achieve our vision while providing a clarity of messaging to the organization about the priorities in the near term. The beauty of this framework is that everyone in the company uses it and relies on it as our collective North Star. Everything we do ties back to purpose and it serves as the primary lens day-to-day uh, -day from strategic planning to decision-making. Um, it's been an amazing tool to align and galvanize our workplace, and I also believe it's played a key role in our current uh, business success. Although we developed the purpose statement before the pandemic, our timing couldn't have been better. Um, it guided our way through this really unprecedented and difficult time. L.L. Beans and the outdoors were in the right place with the right message at a time when we needed it more than ever. Uh, the pandemic has created a major shift in our habits, and our brand and purpose messaging align beautifully with many of those changes. It's led to some remarkable results and business momentum that we're really excited to keep going. And it's not just L.L. Bean that's seeing the success now, too. Um, as an industry, the outdoors has become more important in people's lives, and I couldn't be more excited. Uh, it's a shift that I wanted to see happen as, as these outdoor trends were declining. Um, in addition to my role of exec chairman, I also um, serve on the board of the Outdoor Industry Association, uh, or OIA, the leading trade organization, and they shared these stats with us. Um, in 2020, they reported that nearly 161 million Americans participated in outdoor activities. That was 7.1 million more than in 19, and the trend had been going downward, so it really uh, rebounded. Outdoor partici uh, participation rates have, have climbed significantly, and uh, activities like hiking, camping, and fishing added nearly 20, new, uh, million, 20 million new participants in 2020 alone. So just huge numbers. Um, at L.L. Bean, we're inspired um, by this growing interest and love for the outdoors, because once again, it's why we exist. We also know that we play a key role in continuing this trend, as well as expanding access to ensure, again, that the outdoors is welcoming and inclusive for all. The people of Bean are motivated every day to do all we can to fulfill uh, our promise to be a, a purpose-driven brand. Uh, we serve as role models for what it means, and um, it's a really cool culture that we have in the organization. We're really excited to once again be viewed as a leader in the outdoor space, and it's been propelled by this really important work that we took on in recent years to get back to our roots and who we are. Getting our product strategy right, refocusing our brand positioning and creative expressions towards the outdoors, and really getting clear about our purpose for why we exist. Of course, L.L. Bean's purpose, the company started the moment my great-grandfather launched his outdoor company in 1912. And now, five generations and counting later, it remains my family's responsibility to shepherd this brand to ensure his legacy continues. That means continuing to amplify our purpose, integrating it into everything we do, and inviting our customers to join us in this journey to experience the restorative power of being outside. Thanks for your time today. I'll look forward to taking any questions you might have in a moment, but I'd like to close with a short video that we call um, our anthem video. It's a great visual of our purpose and our enduring commitment to welcoming everyone to the outdoors. Hope you enjoy it.
jumping into the water in that video is one of our Taliban ambassadors. Her name's Myrna. She is an ultra marathoner. She is, the, and, and we, so it's interesting when you, you think of people, and we just ex, we've just expanded our line to kind of have inclusive sizing all at the same price, and we've expanded our sizing range because we're trying to be, um, have products for everybody. Um, but it's, it's really cool because she was like, you know, just because I'm a bigger woman doesn't mean I don't participate in outdoor activities. A lot of people do, and like, I think there's this misconception that you have to be like ultra fit or look ultra fit to be ultra fit. But um, she's a badass. <laughs> Good, so this is Q&A time? Yes, it is. Yeah? Um, so we have how do we do this? Oh, good. So raise your hands and they'll come around and take the cup. I move from hiding behind my podium. Hi, Sean. I'll, I'll kick this off. Tom Gruen, uh, uh, interim chair of the marketing department, professor here. Uh, you, you said a lot, you've got a lot of growth and you've been in the right place at the right time. We also know that there is a lot of supply issues at the same time. Uh, a lot of out of stock, uh, people having to satisfy and you know not buy exactly what they want, but other things. So, so what, what, how have you been dealing with that? How has that conversation been going in LOB? Yeah. So supply chain is it's a huge problem for everyone. You know, try try buying anything, furniture especially. Um, we actually, as we were going into the um, pre-pandemic, we were we were planning our buys for that year, and we had fairly big plans about our growth. And as we purchased all this um, back in 19 and going into 20, and then the pandemic hit, we could have panicked and, and kind of done what a lot of people did and stopped all their orders and, and worked with their vendors to, to stop production because everybody was trying to protect cash, trying to like think that nobody was ever going to shop again. And um, we kind of held our, held our own and we said, you know, a lot of these products are we can sell in the future. It's not all about, you know, we're not fast fashion, so we didn't have to like get rid of merchandise that came in the spring. So we held fast to our, our supply that we had ordered. Really beneficial through um, 2020, because we had a lot of, a lot of goods coming in um, when others were kind of stopping. And then we were direct to consumer business primarily. So when retail stopped and everybody shut their stores, everybody went online. So our e-commerce sales, you know, blew through the roof, and if you didn't have inventory, you weren't going to get it, but if you did, you were going to be very successful, and we had it and felt good. But fast forwarding to kind of current issues, um, we still have a great relationship with our vendors, and I talk about our key stakeholders. Our vendors are one of them. We've never, like, shortchanged a vendor. We've never canceled orders to kind of help us benefit ourselves at their expense. And we've got these beautiful relationships that we've had with vendors for manufacturers for 20, 30, 50 years sometimes. And when we need products, um, they tend to look at us first because we've been a good partner. So we get we get priority in, in production. So that's really helped us. And that was like a, you know, again, that's L.L. Bean's philosophy helping us in this near term. Um, but now as we're, we're moving forward, it, it's hard. I mean, just the logistics of we had to, we probably spent $11 million more on shipping costs to air freight cargo here because um, all the shipping containers were either not in the right place or, you know, the, it, was, it, was, it was a tough time. It's ongoing. I will tell you, we have rock stars who are in our supply chain team who really work with the vendors in the Far East sourcing and uh, in South America to ensure our products are... Uh, are getting here on time, and we've been pretty good. Service levels fell in the holidays because of really high demand, but we had um, we had really good success and luck with with supply chain so far. I think we're a little bit of an exception. Yeah. So we all know, obviously, L.L. Bean is a very successful company, and many times followed by a successful company is a successful team. So how would you describe, over the past 100 years, your team has grown to be as they are today? Hmm. Uh, great question. I can only speak for about 30 of those 100 years, but <laughs> um, I will say that uh, being a family-owned company is kind of nice to have because you have, like, high control over what you're going to stand for. You've got a pretty finite group of shareholders and owners who um, tell you what they want the brand to be like, their expected financial return. 
what they expect from the business, which has been great. Um, but interestingly, when my LL ran the company, my uncle took it over upon LL's death. LL ran the company until he was 94 years old. That's not ideal. <laughs> but my uncle um, took over at the age of 32. He was LL's grandson. Um, and he really transformed Bean into what it is today, kind of modernizing systems and making it, making it what it is. He had these great teams that he put together, but he was a very high control guy. And um, we talked about this a little bit at lunch, but our culture has shifted. When I came into the company at, in 1991, for the first 10 years, it was like, um, it felt like everyone in the organization doing all the work, like all the people, the managers and associate analysts or whatever, had this idea of being collaborative but you had this really siloed, high control area, so marketing wanted to control the messaging here. Merchandising had their own strategies. Operations you know, wanted to do things the way they did to be as efficient as they could, and they weren't all talking together. And it was this, um, when I became chairman, one of the things I wanted to change was that culture, of moving from kind of a high control culture to one of more collaboration, kind of being a little bit more transparent with our employees, being really clear about our business planning processes. That's why we, again, developed the business framework. Just making it crystal clear what we're all about, what we're trying to achieve, so that they know that every day they're working towards something that achieves that and they can kind of tie back to that purpose. I would say um, I hired our CEO, Steve Smith, um, five years ago, six years ago. And um, I haven't regretted a day of it. The guy is um, an absolutely perfect cultural fit at L.L. Bean. And if you don't fit the culture at Bean, it's kind of akin to organ, fit, uh, organ rejection. You'll get, you will get spit out. And uh, I've seen it happen. But Steve was this perfect balance of um, empathy, collaborative thinker, wants to get everybody's points of view, but he can be clear and decisive. And he's really technically expert. And he's developed over the past five years, thanks to the pandemic, too, into this absolutely complete CEO. And he has a team under him, our executive team, that is filled with people with humility. They're all really smart people. But we get together knowing that the common objective is to um, win against the competitors, not win against each other internally to figure out who's going to get the advancement. And um, we've got a really beautiful culture that's shifted. And um, I was talking, it's our time to do reviews at LLB right now. And I've been talking to people and gathering data on our CEO. and. Uh, None of you have, some of you have kids, but a lot of you students don't. But like, there's a point in your life when you have children and they're like eight or 10 years old and you wish you could keep them right there and freeze that position. And I wish I could do that with my exec team right now because it is just, they are, it's a team of rock stars who are, who are uh, just functioning so beautifully as a team. It feels really good. Hi. Go ahead, Evan. Um, so as you kind of mentioned, the pandemic truly has benefited you guys from a business standpoint. More and more people were spending time outside. Um, as things hopefully slowly start to shift to more of a normalcy, are you expecting these numbers to kind of stay the same or are you starting to prepare for what life after this craziness will look like? Yeah, it's interesting. It's a, um, I'm not sure what the long-term impact will be. I love the shifts and the trends of more people going outside and looking to the outdoors. I think it's here to stay a, a bit. I mean, you see people leaving the workforce earlier because they realize that as, as they've had this time at home and with their family, that, hey, there are a hell of a lot of things that are more important uh, than me working 60 or 80 hours a week, right? And it's that you work to live, not the other way around, and, and I think people have reset themselves in a big way, which I was kind of hoping for for years. You just, again, I talk about that hyper-competitive, hyper-stressed world we live in. Um, we're spending all day, we're so connected on our devices, we're never away from work. Um, it's so good to get outside. I really feel like the pandemic was something that we needed to shift people's mindset. You needed something massive like that to happen, and it's unfortunate that it happened that way, but. Um, it did shift people's mindsets, and I actually am one of the people who believe it's here to stay. And when I talk about we need to do our part, it, that's why we exist. And I want to do my part to make sure we're sharing messages about the, the benefits of spending time outside, that restorative value of being outside. 
And the more we can push that, I hope the more people adopt it and will be reminded of it and, and keep spending time outdoors. But um, to be seen, I guess. But I'm, I'm a little bullish on people being in the outdoors. Hi, um, I wanted to ask, as Ello Bean shifted towards a more modern stakeholder theory, what was the most important stakeholder you hadn't considered previously? Ooh, um, it's interesting. So the stakeholders that we've had here, as long as I can remember, have been the stakeholders in the company. We've always been the stakeholder business. Um, I think if I look at something, though, to answer your question a little bit, um, I would say that what we try to do is make sure that no one stakeholder is benefiting at the expense of another. So you don't want to shortchange employees on pay so that the shareholders can have a huge payout, right? Um, and you don't want to make sh your vendors suffer because you have the, the power to do that. You pay them less so that you can make more margin on your products. So we really watch that. But one area where we did kind of see a, a, a change, and this happened in kind of 17, 18, I would say we had a new um, chief marketing officer come in who was outside of the company, and I grew up in marketing, I've seen, I know it, I know direct marketing really well. Um, he started putting us on sale, and he, he, he thought we could grow by being really promotional, and it was like trying to keep up with the Amazons and everybody who was the, the big discounter. So there was a time not too long ago that Bean was on sale with 15, 20, 25% site-wide sale offers every other week. It was like every other week we were on sale. And that is just an absolute killer, unless you're growing. And we weren't growing at the time. And what I would say was happening there is the consumer was really driving that. Um, Everybody thought that the only way to grow, all the retailers, that we have to discount. If we don't discount, we can't keep up with everybody else, the Amazons, whomever. Um, it's a race to the bottom. And what I was looking at, it was, like, it was really that the consumer was benefiting because they were getting great pricing and weren't paying really what the, the cost associated with those products should have been. Like, we weren't making any money at those times with those big promotions. And I would say that they were benefiting at the expense of all the other stakeholders because we weren't healthy at the core of our business. And if you're not healthy at the, the core of your business and have a reasonable profit, there's no way you can take care of those, those stakeholders that sit around the core of the business. So that's been one shift. And I don't think the consumer rejected it. We were just offering something that they could, were taking advantage of. But as we've shifted back, we've started seeing margins increase, um, which means that we're making more money. And when we make more money, our charitable giving is associated with the bottom line. And so our charitable giving goes out, so the community benefits, our outdoor access fund benefits. And um, yeah, it's, it's worked out really well. But that's kind of the one example where I've said we, we focus too hard on one at the expense of another. Does that answer your question OK? OK, cool. Thanks. Um, so obviously at like a macro scale, advertising has changed a lot. And I know LL Bean is pretty big on like mailers and stuff like that. And so coming from the advertising world, I was curious if you could speak to how like your ad strategy has changed, um, like post pandemic or like recent times. Yeah, it's, um, so I started, I was in, the first job at Bean was an advertising analyst. So I measured the response to catalog ads that we put in like Yankee magazine or whatever, some good one. But, um, and then we'd see how many people received those catalogs and who converted into buyers. And it was pretty simple direct marketing 101. Um, I was telling someone at lunch, I think we were sitting there, and I said, we were talking about Google and, and their facilities. And um, I said, I said, Google drives up to L.L. Bean every week with an empty tractor trailer truck that we fill with cash. And then they drive away. And I'm like, that, 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 it's a machine. I mean, like. Um, Data-driven selling and targeted targeted advertising is so big. The data that they have, the algorithms and the decisions that happen in those auctioning from the time someone clicks a button to what's served in your, your ads, is, it's mind-blowing. So if, we, if you're into big data, you're going to do well. If you're um, pretty scientific, if you think that way, you'll probably do well in life. But the shifts are interesting, kind of moving from catalog-specific with mailers to um, to the web and kind of the mid 90s for us, things have shifted in the way we, we um, monitor, you know, or, or track customers. 
and advertising had to shift with it, and the web's probably the, the biggest shift. I mean, um, we don't do much print media at all. Uh, we do a lot of targeted spending. We like to measure everything we do. We can do it, and as long as that advertising return on sales is there, um, we're gonna do that if it, if it makes sense, and right now it makes sense. Um, so huge shifts there. I do, it, it's, it's kind of funny, like as a, as a hundred plus year old brand who's worked really hard to develop yourself as a brand, it's really tough when somebody can come in and go to Google and say, I want to serve my content, which is very similar to L.L. Bean's, to all the people that have all the attributes that L.L. Bean customers have, and they can do it because they've got all the data. Um, so you're out there, competition gets pretty fierce, but that's where, I mean, that's where I think you really need to be a brand. If you're a retailer in this world, it's tough. So you really have to differentiate and stand for something as a brand. So that's that's probably the most consistent thing for us is making sure we stand for something. But the changes in media are massive. And uh, unless we have some massive privacy laws or big shifts where people say you can no longer use my data, uh, which I think happened to uh, Facebook, um, you know, you're going to have, you're going to continue to see the, the trend advance more. We see it just a, a funny anecdote. We started automatic member identification at Bean like in the early 90s where if you called up to place an order, we saw your number and we could bring up your data and say like, oh, hello, Mr. Smith, it's so nice. Thank you for calling out Bean. And people freaked out. How do you know my name? And I'm like, oh, it's associated to your phone number. If those people knew what we're doing behind the scenes with their data now, they would just lose it. I, I, I just think the general public doesn't have any idea <laughs> how much data is out there. And it's all these big companies are just data gatherers, and then we sell it to everyone. But it's a cool field to be in. You're going to like it. Okay. Down the One decision that you made, or being made, uh, that actually made me a little sad, and I just want to, even though I never took advantage of the promise, was the elimination of the lifetime guarantee. Uh, how in why did you make that decision, and was it as big a deal as it felt to me as it was to you? Bigger. <laughs> it's a big deal, and uh, this is interesting. It was, that took a long time to make that decision, and I will just say one thing. Um, L.L. Bean has always had a 100% satisfaction guarantee. It was never a lifetime guarantee, and people look, looked upon it that way. But we would have, it, it, what happened was LL's intent when he put that in place was that if we have products that fail you, we want to replace it. We will stand behind it. We still do that. The shift that we had gave someone a year to bring a product back when they determined that it was not satisfactory to them. After that year, it became our determination to say, oh, there was a manufacturer's defect. Here's a new one. So you can still bring products back if they fail. And we're, we'll stand behind them. The problem was we had people really taking advantage of it. We called them the Goodwill Hunters. They'd go to Goodwill, they'd buy every item from L.L. Bean for like a dollar, and then come up to L.L. Bean and return it. There wasn't a product they bought. There wasn't a product that they, you know, ever had. And there were, there were people, I mean, we have video of people coming up, and there were networks of people who would do this. This wasn't like one or two things. We have people coming up with garbage bags of merchandise to go to our retail stores and bring things back. And the biggest reason for changing is the, the customer who was using it for the right reason was suffering because we had to charge more because the, the returns were so high. And it just wasn't right. And we get so many complaints from, from, uh, from our customers that I was standing in line, I saw somebody bring back something that was clearly worn out. You gave them a new product with no questions asked, and I know I'm paying for that. And um, it's a big problem. So we, we shifted it, um, really targeting that if, if you didn't have proof of receipt, uh, if you didn't have, um, um, it, and we <coughs> collect data, even if you pay cash, we know who you are and you, you bought the product. So that really proof of receipt was, was a big deal. And most people who were returning didn't have proof of receipt because it wasn't items they purchased. So that was a big thing that shut things down. When we launched it, I would say that 90% of the communications we got about the change was positive, where people thanked us for changing it. And I think, I would hope that if you were returning something that wasn't satisfactory, like after a year, 
um, that we would stand behind that for the life of the product if, if there was something truly wrong with the quality of the product. We won't, we won't diminish quality. We, we just didn't want to be taken advantage of. And, uh, I never returned anything for a defect. It was sure, just I can the check I on that. I can check on that. No, no, you can. <laughs> I just want, I, it was sort of a feeling of comfort, you know, this promise that you could do it. Yeah, you no, to. there is. And I mean, and honestly, anything that you purchased prior to the new policy going in, into effect <laughs> fell under the old, it, that never changed. It, it was only for products going forward. Um, we try to be clear about that, but I think people are just like, oh, you changed your policy. But for us, um, we're allowed, we're, we're doing a better job of, of maintaining our, um, our net sales, net merge sales, because we don't have these massive returns that go back. I mean, um, we were up in the, man, it was pushing, it was pushing after the holidays. There were times where 30% of the goods were coming back. And, and that's, um, just unsustainable. I think during LL's day, the max was probably 10%. And these come back for a, var a variety of reasons. That's like products that it didn't fit me right. You return it to stock, re return it to stock, and resell it. But the, we call them third-party, third-party uh, rejects, uh, third-quality, excuse me, rejects. People would literally bring in garbage. Like you'd have a pair of wicked good slippers that somebody wore for 30 years falling apart at the seams. And I would look at that and say, that is the definition of satisfaction. <laughs> you know, you, you've had this for a long time. So we've gotten rid of that, and I think it's better for all our stakeholders. We're we wrapping up? Yeah. Okay, good. I mean, not good, right. but there was a question. <laughs> all right, thank you so much for everyone asking questions. And once again, thank you, Sean, for taking your time. <laughs> So that was awesome. It was definitely an honor to share the stage with you here today, right now. Um, so we're going to transition to our next panel. Uh, and for now, we're just going to need about five minutes just to transition. Uh, so if you guys want to hang tight, take a quick break, we're going to move into panel two with some of our industry professionals, some from Red Bull, Small Army, Easter Seals, and Riddle and Bloom. So please stay tuned. Thank you.
Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for attending our first panel. My name is Amanda Zubricki, and I'm the Vice President for MAC, and therefore I'm so thrilled that this event has come together so wonderfully. I am now pleased to introduce the first panel with our marketing industry leaders to you all. On our panel, we have Joe Dulac, a UNH alum who is the Marketing Director of Red Bull, Meredith Elkins, Senior Vice President of Marketing Communications for Easter Seals NH, Matt Fasano, a UNH undergrad and MBA alum, Senior Vice President and Director of Client Services for Riddle and Bloom, and Jeff Friedman, UNH alum, CEO for Swell Army. Our moderator is Diane Devine, Senior Lecturer and our wonderful MAC faculty sponsor. I'm now going to hand it over to you, Diane, and let you get started with our first MAC MAC panel. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, everyone, for coming. We are thrilled that we have such an esteemed collection of industry experts with us today from all different types of industries, from the largest not-for-profit in the state of New Hampshire to two marketing agencies, as well as Red Bull. And I see everybody is enjoying their Red Bull, <laughs> which was provided for us by um, Joe and his team. So we're going to start. And the first question is, in one of two sentences, why don't you give us your name, your company, and the role you play? All right, I guess I get to start us off. Um, really excited to be back on campus as UNH alums, so thanks for having me. Um, my name's Joe. I'm a marketing director at Red Bull. I cover the northeast part of the US, uh, based out of our office in Boston. I manage a team of senior managers across brand marketing, sports marketing, culture marketing, and communications. Those are the four really pillars of marketing at Red Bull. Um, really, my job as the marketing director is to build our strategy, our vision, where we're going as a business in the Northeast, and really rallying that, that team of marketers to build strategic plans, um, working together to really drive our, our business outcomes. So um, yeah, and I've been with Red Bull 12 years, so it's been, it's been a while. Hi, everybody. I'm Meredith Elkins. I'm actually the inaugural SVP of Marketing and Communications for Easter Seals, New Hampshire. And what that means is I'm building everything from scratch. Um, it's exciting and scary at the same time because we have no data to fall back on. We are, uh, my team of six, we are covering everything. We do social media, we do the web, we do email marketing, we support our development fundraising colleagues, we write for the president, we do help with events, we do it all. Um, I have been there since December of 2020. And they, they joke with me and they say, and you're still smiling. And I say, yes, I am. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jeff Friedman. I'm the founder and CEO of Small Army, which is a full-service marketing agency in Boston, about 35 people. And our clients range from consumer financial services, healthcare, education, technology, pretty broad range of services. And so aside from running the agency, I, I think my, my big role with, with clients is helping them what we call, help them discover the moral of their story, which is ultimately what is their, the soul of their brand. And I'll, maybe I'll talk about that more as we, as we uh, get into the panel discussion. Um, and we're also part of a much larger firm. Um, we're part of an organization called Fin Partners, which is about a 1,200 person uh, global communications firm. So we have offices, uh, 22 offices everywhere from Jerusalem, Singapore, Hong Kong, Chicago, uh, wherever. That's why I won't name well. Um, anyway, happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, I think this works. Everyone hear me okay? <laughs> awesome. How did uh, you get that one? <laughs> He's special. <laughs> my name is Matt Fasato. I'm the Senior Vice President Director of Client Services at Riddle and Bloom. We are an ideas and access marketing company uh, focused on the next generation of consumers. So what that means largely is we focus on 14 to 35 year olds with a core really in the college space. A uh, team of about 60 to 65, we've been growing like crazy, uh, which is a good thing. And my role largely is operational, so really helping be sort of the conduit and facilitator across sales and revenue to client services and delivery, but also university relations, which is a key differentiator for our business. And I'll talk a little bit about that in terms of our partnerships and what we do. But uh, we service clients like Amazon, HBO, Comcast, Microsoft. Um, so get to work with some big brands and do some pretty cool work with uh, younger audiences, which is great. Great, thank you, and welcome again. And welcome back, or welcome home for our Wildcat. All right, so Sean Gorman just talked about purposeful brands, which is, as we all know, not just selling things, but aspiring to something greater. 
Can you talk about how your company or even your clients, how do you create or generate purposeful branding? I'm going to start with Meredith first. That's not fair. This is a softball for me. <laughs> so, because we are, our, our brand is our mission. And our mission is to be an unwavering ally to people of all abilities throughout the state of New Hampshire. We also support families in transition in Vermont, and we also do substance, uh, substance use services for New Hampshire as well. So it's really simple because our work is our brand and our brand is helping. Um, and the interesting thing, and we'll probably get into this later with, uh, with other questions that come up, but one of the interesting things is in my experience, I've been in the nonprofit space for about 15, 20 years now, and marketing is a dirty word. And, but if you don't market, how do you serve people? So it's counterintuitive. So yeah, so we, we live the brand every day because it's what we, it's, it's the services we provide and we have to tell people what we can offer them and by the same token, we also have to tell supporters why we need them to support us so we can help. Awesome, I love that unwavering now. All right, let's start with you, Joe. How does Red Bull create purpose? Yeah, so our brand purpose, why we exist, um, our mission is to give wings to people and ideas, and it's been like that since the beginning. So that, the nice thing about that purpose is that, that mission is that it's really broad. It can mean a lot of different things. So we, we give wings to college students by giving them the, the energy they need to be you know, like the best version of themselves and um, really you know, achieve what they want to their time on campus, right? But it also manifests through uh, the athletes, the dancers, the artists that we work with as a brand and giving wings to their ideas and their aspirations. So. Um, an example, we have a snowboarder um, actually based out in the Northeast called Zeb Powell. Everyone should look him up. He was actually the first black athlete to win a gold medal at the Winter X Games. So um, it didn't mean much to him at the time, but he started to realize that he has a platform and he wanted to find ways to make the outdoors, similar to what, what um, Sean talked about with L.L. Bean, more accessible and you know encourage people who are underrepresented in the sport of snowboarding to get out on the hill. So, we created um, what we call the Red Bull Slide-In Tour. As an example, giving wings, he was like, how can we get more people out there? What can you do to help me with this, this um, my purpose that I found as an athlete? Um, Slide-In Tour actually kicks off today. Uh, it's like a seven-stop tour up the East Coast with Zeb and his friends and partnering with different organizations like Hoods to Woods, uh, the Chill Foundation, and we have clinics where anyone can come and ski and snowboard and just feel the mountain culture for free. We have equipment, there's no lift tickets. Um, so that's just one way, one example of giving wings to one of our athletes and, and ultimately giving back to the community of uh, snow sports, which we played in for a long time. And then, you know, there's examples of that across everything we do across the United States. So it's one of like thousands of examples of giving wings, but um, yeah, it manifests in, in many, many ways across our, our marketing efforts. Great. Pick up. Yeah. Sure, I'll go. Um, I think there's two sides of this for us, right? So we have our own purpose, and then we work with our clients to help them discover their purpose. I, I call it their happily ever after. So for Small Army, we're in the business of helping brands build relationships with people. That is what we do, and that, that is why we do what we do. Uh, but we take it to another level. So I think there's the, the purpose, and I think as Sean talked about, right, you have to find your why. And I, I tell clients all the time, you know, a lot of in marketing, we're always taught, you know, what do you do, who you do it for, how do you do it, what makes you unique. All that stuff is great. But that's going to change every day. What, what stays at your heart for 100, over 100 years is why you do what you do. And so you got to find the, the heart of the organization. And I call that the, the happily ever after, but I also take it to the moral of the story. So um, the moral of the story for Small Army is the strongest relationships are built upon shared beliefs. And that's why we help you find your heart. That's why we help you find your soul. And I can talk about how we do that for other clients. But as I listen to Sean talk today, I, was, I can't help myself when I look at these presentations. Like, what is the moral of L.L. Bean's story? And, I, and, and it actually it came out at the end of that video. And, and I kept thinking to myself, what's the moral of the L.L. Bean story? And I think it's something like uh, being outside is good for us, right? I mean, that's really, that is, at the end of the day, and when you think of, when you can find your heart and when you find your purpose, when you can find why you do what you do, it actually, it's not just what L.L. Bean believes, but it's what everybody in this, it's what all their customers believe. In fact, if you don't believe being outside is good for you, you won't ever go to L.L. Bean. In fact, I'd recommend against going to L.L. Bean. You'll hate it, right? But if you really believe being outside is good for you, you should live at L.L. Bean. Like, camp out in a tent inside this store in Freeport, right? I mean, that's what, and, and by the way, and then there's the, and the beauty is over the last couple of years with the pandemic, people realized being outside is good for you. Right? And that's why their business has taken off. 
And the more they can educate people and, and give and help help demonstrate that being outside is good for you, the more that business is going to do good. So I, it's not about what you do, who you do it for, and how you do it. That's kind of, that's the basics. It's about knowing why you do what you do. And that's what we help every brand we do. Uh, that's so. great. And I love find their happily ever after. Yeah. That is so cool yeah. as well from an agency perspective. Matt. Uh, so it's interesting, and similarly, similarly, on the agency side, you know, we don't necessarily have that sort of consumer-facing brand representation or visibility that a Red Bull or an L would be like, uh, right? So our purpose is uh, sort of manifest itself across two different stakeholders and relationship sites, but it's largely built on connection. And our positioning is an ideas and access agency focused on the next generation of consumers. So if you think about our business model, we as a services business and an agency service clients, right? So we are creating connections with our clients and what our purpose there is really is to identify and articulate a message to this core audience around their purpose so that they can, they can build that connection. Well, separately, you know, the business model was really founded on a few key partnerships and relationships within the college and university space which is the National Association for Campus Activities, NACA, some of you might be familiar with this, uh, National Association for Collegiate Auxiliary Services, and then NERSA, which is largely rec and sports and all those sorts of things. So behind the scenes, we have this whole team of university relations folks who are building relationships with these partners and then the schools themselves and all of these students. So there's this massive ecosystem of relationships and partnerships that exist to create connections within the university and largely college ecosystem to be able to give opportunity. And that might be with a brand, that might be through a marketing engagement, that might be through trying to drive some level of purchase or conversion. But on the other side of that, we engage and employ about 2,000 students on an annual basis. We provide development opportunities and internships for them. Uh, we're providing programming for a lot of these trade organizations where there might be scholarships or opportunities for students to grow, or for those associations to grow as well. So in everything that we do, from sort of a financial perspective or just a behind the scenes perspective, it is really largely about creating connections in the space in which we operate and adding value to the audiences and communities where we, where we play. Great, and I love the fact that you are all talking about what your purpose is, what's your why and what's your how, and also tying in what Sean showed us in that beautiful chart which I love and appreciate. And I have taught most of you students about Hopefully they remembered and recognized that, especially the perceptual mapping. How many recognize the perceptual mapping? Very good. <laughs> okay, so love that, love that. Uh, my next question is, marketing is so fluid. We're constantly learning and constantly changing. What are some emerging trends that you're seeing and what are some tools and tricks that you are now taking on as a result of these? emerging trends and fluidity of the market. Anybody can jump in. I will start. Go I'll ahead. Do that. Um, so just think about our core business. Let's just talk about the college space just for a second. So those 2,000 students that we might engage in an annual basis, um, largely like student ambassador campus rep programs representing Amazon Prime Student, HBO, Comcast, whomever, that has been sort of a, a key tenant of our business for a long time, right? Sort of a channel through which to activate and essentially articulate a message that has this relevance and personalized tone and messaging to those students. What we saw in COVID, obviously, was the students left campus. Campus is closed down. And we never really had to test of the notion that the campus community existed beyond the physical walls. We didn't want to do that because that was really largely our business model, but we did, and it worked. So what we really established was that this community existed regardless of the physical space, and we were really able to make that actionable through a variety of different things. So we tested some more sort of national progr programming stuff, but largely where we excelled and did really well, and I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with, is social. And so social has always been a very sort of key channel for communication, engagement, and all those sorts of things. But I would say the acceleration of the social influence of category and industry has been incredible. Right, so if you look at TikTok over the past two years just as a platform itself, that is insane. Uh, additionally, I think everybody has really strived to become an influencer in some way, shape, and form in terms of like a specific niche or just trying to gain follower count. And that has actually emerged into this its own business model where it's a very, very competitive marketplace where we've uh, really started to dive in and play a lot more so that we're doing a lot more work on the social side with these nano and micro influencers who have a lot of influence generally outside of sort of your macro influencer type base. 
for brands while also using and leveraging the ability to create content from an organic social perspective for a lot of these brands. So it's a very interesting space right now and it's super fast moving, uh, which is a really exciting thing for us and we like it. I mean, I would, I'd agree, like, the influence of marketing. I mean, we, it, you know, five years ago, I don't think we were thinking much about influence of marketing, aside from, you know, the stuff that Red Bull is used to. Like, we have our celebrities and all that. Now, you know, we use tools like Tagger is, is one where, you know, it's a database where you can go in and you can identify, you know, Diane has 5,000 followers that are, inter you know, students. Well, let's go after Diane because she can influence 5,000 students and we can pay her. Fifty dollars to do a post. So we well, we can say five hundred maybe. <laughs> so I, I think that that's you know the influence of marketing, artificial intelligence. I think we can all of that stuff is trends. For me, as someone who runs an agency, I think what's really interesting right now, and probably our biggest challenge, and the thing I think about is how do we keep people right, and how do we get people excited to be working at Small Army? And I think it's challenges all of our clients think about. And you know, I, I will go back to purpose at some level, which is. You know, at the end of the day, people are leaving not because they're not getting paid enough. They're they're leaving because they're not happy and they feel like their organizations are not are not purpose driven or they're not doing things or they're doing things for the wrong reasons. I'll tell you, like last night, I got an email from a friend of mine who runs a, um, a pharmaceutical company in in Boston. They just got 20 plus million dollars in in funding. It was like a second round, and he said, and he sent me an email saying, I don't know what to do. My culture committee just said to me that they want me to they want me to make a five thousand dollar donation to Ukraine. I don't know I'm not comfortable giving five thousand dollars Ukraine because that's the investor money. And I wrote back to him, I said, Are you out of your mind? Like that is the easiest decision you have to make. Five thousand dollars, tell your entire company, in fact, tell them you will match five thousand dollars. Let them encourage them to make donations to the same organization. You match it up to five thousand dollars. It is one of the best things you'll do for morale and retention. If you don't do it, they're out of there. If they see that you don't care about what's going on in the world. So I, I think thinking about company, like I, I think that's what I think about every day. To me, if, if our people leave, we're done. And I, I need people to come into the office every day or at least maybe wake up these days, go into the kitchen. But wherever they're going, <laughs> and feel good about, you know, get excited to be at work, feel acknowledged when they're there and, you know, leave with a smile on their face. Like that's, I tell every, that, every employee, if I can do that well, we're going to, we'll do well. Uh, and part of that, it, that's not just about making money. It's not just about paying them. It's about feeling like you're part of an organization that is that is making a positive impact in the world. And by the way, that goes to it goes to philanthropy. It goes to the clients we choose to work with. Um, it, it goes to how we treat people. Um, all of that stuff. So th that's for me. Like that's it's been a big wake up call. I think to a lot of organizations in the last year as the great resignation is happening around us. So. And I love Jeff at Small Army. You were so out there in terms of social as well. I mean, your blogs, your email campaigns, I, I get them all, I subscribe oh, to them all. Excellent. And you have such great points. I just love what you said. Thanks. Yeah. I have a, just a build on influencer marketing. Um, actually, at Red Bull, we call them social opinion leaders. Um, but I think one of the areas we're seeing evolve, other brands are evolving, is that it's like less about pay to play, pay to play or pay for one post. It's like, how, Brands are starting to build more long-term, meaningful relationships with these uh, opinion leaders, these, these influencers, right? And it's less transactional, it's more authentic. So we, we don't pay influencers in that sense at Red Bull, uh, but a lot of brands I think are starting to uh, take that same approach where it's how can we integrate them into our brand moments, but also how can we, we say, give wings to the things that they're doing as well. Um, you know, if it's a basketball influencer who wants to do, you know, camps uh, for female, young female athletes, like how do we give wings to that and support them and what they're doing and then, you know, when we're doing a Red Bull basketball event, they're supporting us and um, helping us spread the word within their network. So it's really this like organic, um, multi, you know, uh, mutual beneficial uh, relationships. So that's one trend in, in influencer marketing, I think. Um, these these one-off paid posts are kind of like people are seeing through them. It's an ad, um, and I think that um, it's more impactful when you have a genuine relationship with the person. Um, one other thing with the, within content marketing, I think uh, similarly, it's it's like less polished content is doing better. So behind the scenes, the raw stuff, it doesn't need to be overly produced. I think we produce a lot of content that is overly produced, but we're starting to do a lot more that is raw behind the scenes, um, and also building like serialized content. Um, building series, not just one-off content, but things that consumers come back to and building those like repeatable audiences that want to come see the series that you have on your 
channels that you launch a different episode every single week versus just having like random content that, that doesn't tie back together. So a um, couple different trends there. Great. Meredith, you've got multiple audiences. Go for it. Well, we also have the challenge of, I mean, we can't even spell influencer marketing because, like, we don't, yeah, that's just not who we are, and we don't have that money. Um, not that we wouldn't love it. I mean, $50. yeah, well, I could do $50. <laughs> we come to write for me for $50. Um, but what we are, we actually, I think, so what we pivoted was we pivoted our services. Easter Seals predominantly offers direct service care to people who are disabled or have some kind of um, impediment. And that was really hard during the pandemic. And so one of our big pivots was finding ways to continue to deliver those services. Um, I think I can proudly say that during the course of the pandemic, we lost no one. We lost no clients and we lost no staff. And that, I mean, to, to, to be honest, to, to COVID. So we're in an unusual position in that I'm building everything from the ground up, as I said. So it's not so much that we're chasing what's next, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. We're looking at what we can do purposefully and deliberately and intentionally. What is the right set of tools for our audience and for our constituents? So for example, we didn't do online fundraising. We do now. So we cho we're, we're choosing, we're picking. So what I would say to you is, when you go out into the world and when you take a job, don't let someone say to you, oh, we don't have enough money for that, because there's always a way around. You don't need to follow the next bright, shiny thing. Again, not that that's bad. Sometimes it's good. Um, but so we've done, we've done purposeful choosing, I would say, is what, how we've pivoted, because we've had an open slate to pick from. And what are some of the marketing tools I'll come right oh, back sure. to you that you utilize? So we're, we're, we have a lot of social, of course, because that's the way of the world right now. Um, we have really boosted our LinkedIn presence to try to gain more recruiting um, traction. Um, as you said, recruiting is a big deal for us. We have a very, um, it's very meaningful work, but it's hard work. You know, you're giving direct care to somebody. It's intimate, and it's, and it's I'm going to say it's probably more satisfying than putting cereal boxes on a shelf, but it's also harder. And we're not going to probably pay you that much better. But at home, you're going to go home at night knowing you've made a difference, a significant difference in somebody's life. So we use social, we use LinkedIn, Insta, Facebook, Twitter. Um, we are looking at a, a, a more purposeful website. We're looking at more purposeful data collection around our outcomes. Outcomes are king in, in our world. Um, we actually, as our affiliated Easter Sales, were unfortunately passed over from the Kenzie Scott money. And yes, I still dab a tear away every so often because other affiliates in the network across the country did get some Kenzie Scott money. So we think about the way we pick our outcomes uh, reporting and, and then just the usual events and weekends. Okay, good. That was rambly, sorry. No, no, that was great. Um, so you hit on a point, which is in the marketing world, data is king, or it's key. Tell us a little bit about how you use data, what kind of data do you deliver, and what approaches are you taking with the results from the data? Anyone can jump in. I can start. Um, data is definitely a huge part of my job, and, and as any marketer these days, probably. Um, I think as marketers, we're always trying to figure out what is the problem that we're trying to solve, what's the opportunity that we're trying to uncover, and that starts with, with data. So um, in my day-to-day, -day, we, we look at data across a lot of different, we have several different sources of data from you know, sales data, literally like what went across the register, to survey data, panel data, uh, where people tell us how they feel about our brand or our products. Um, then we have you know, receipt data where people upload their receipts um, you know, from an app, and we can see what they bought, how much they spent. There's like tons of data that we, we get access to, but as a marketer, it's really, for me, just triangulating that data, seeing like, are there patterns? Like, what, what are we seeing across these multiple sources of data? And what's the story that, that um, is telling us, right? And from there, we build our strategy using that data. So um, more, I think, you know, back in the day, we didn't have as much data. It was kind of like Wild West. We just had to figure it out and make some, hopefully some good lucky guesses, but now we have the luxury of data where we can really root our decisions, our investments, like what we want to do, the athletes we want to sign, the events we want to produce, the campaigns we want to run, all is based on, on data and what we're finding from that data. So um, it's really, really effective, but also I think you, it's a little art and science. You also like know your brand, like L. Bean, like you know the brand, right? You know what, what to do that's, and um, what's right to do and what's right for your consumer. So it's a bit of 
there's a little bit of gut involved as well, so you don't want to ever lose, get like drowned in data, but it's, it's definitely important. I like to bore people with a story, you may have never heard it, but the, Mr. Wrigley of the gum fame had his VP of, of marketing come to him one day and say, Mr. Wrigley, great news, half of our advertising is working. And Mr. Wrigley said, excellent, cut the budget in half. And he said, but we don't know, the vice president of marketing said, we don't know which half is working. So I think that's what your point is, is that we have so much more data to track now. And again, we're at the beginning stages, so we track the usual suspects. What, is, what are people doing with our digital presence? How many people are responding to our emails or coming to our events or clicking through? What's their time on site? Where are they going? What are they doing? Where are they abandoning? It's just trying to figure out, I mean, we have a buyer. We don't have the same buyer as L.L. Bean, of course, but we have a buyer. We either have a client buyer or we have a donor buyer. What are they doing? And um, we, we are also in a situation where some of our systems don't talk well together. I have a, a campaign in place for some of our programming that is performing at three times the industry average for the technique, for the tactic, and I haven't seen a program bump in six months. In fact, it's done this. Now, is it the marketing? Probably not, but what is it? So then you have to go beyond, and then you have to have your partners, right? You have to have your in internal partners helping you figure out what other data points you're not looking at so you can tell. So. Great. So, I, I think there's kind of two sides of the data. One is data uh, is for the targeting perspective, but not the measurement perspective with targeting. I mean, that's, I started this business a long time ago. I graduated the year after Sean. And so, I mean, I was buying print ads it for weighing computers and Lotus. That don't date me here. I don't know if you're So, you know, that was before the web. Email was like this new kind of thing. The web didn't exist yet. And, you know, there, there was no measurement. And, um, and I think, and, and there was no targeting. Now, like, our media team is, like, targeting based on, you know, what you had for breakfast this morning. So it's amazing. So the, the data from that perspective of the targeting is just incredible. We can target people, you know, and as, as Sean kind of alluded to, you know, when iOS changes how they do cookies and now Google's going to change their thing, that changes. And, it, you know, for me, that's kind of one of the things that makes this industry really exciting is it changes every day, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, but it always kind of keeps us on edge. Uh, and then the other side of that is the data for measurement. And the one thing I warn all of our team about is just because you measure, can measure it doesn't mean it's worth measuring, right? So, I mean, I've seen clients, like, we've been, like we, we have a client we run, you know, regularly in the Wall Street Journal. The whole point of it is brand awareness. And, and this client keeps saying, how many, how many, how, how is um, the traffic on our website changed when we run these journal ads? I said, well, I won't say what I say, but <laughs> it's like, who cares? Like, how many, how many people here have seen an ad in the Wall Street Journal and go, oh my God, I have to type in that URL? Like, nobody. Like, why even put your URL in there? So I think it's a matter of you got to measure the right stuff and then look at the why. Like, it's just, you have to really get, dig deep into that data. So, you know, always look at benchmarks. The other thing I hate when I get a report and it says, we have, you know, 500 clicks, 500 conversions. Well, that's good. Do we spend a million dollars on those 500 conversions? Or do we spend $10 on those 500 conversions? And was that's your goal a thousand? Right. <laughs> yeah, so it's, I, I think data is critical, but you need the right people to look at it and look at it and normalize it and understand kind of and have it compare it to what are the benchmarks. And, and so um, I love data. I'm a, I'm a nerd at some level. Well, no, I'm a nerd, period, <laughs> not at some <laughs> level. Um, but you have to know kind of what you're measuring. And, and not everything, and so like, we still do benchmark surveys, right? It's yeah. like, let's measure awareness today and let's look in six months and sure. see how measurement, see how awareness changed. Let's see how perceptions change. Let's see how people think about us versus our, our, our other brands. I still think surveys work. Yeah. Um, so it's not just about, you know, digital data. Um, I am also a nerd, so full stop. I enjoy data bunch, a lot. Bunch of nerds up here. Me too, me too. <laughs> we, uh, we, we, we gather a lot of data, but I will focus on sort of two key areas of data collection for us that really influence our business. Um, the first one is consumer research and insights. As an audience-focused agency, understanding the consumer is critical for a number of reasons. And the first one being we need to be an expert in the space with which we claim to be an expert, and we can't do that without that information. So from that perspective, it really helps our sales story and our narrative and really allow us to ideate and strategize around how a brand can engage with and reach this audience in, in a compelling way, right? Um, so I would say, you know, we do a lot in the sort of data gathering perspective for consumer research, but if you look at things 
in particular over COVID, there was this flood of research that was happening. Everything was moving real time. Attitudes, preferences, behaviors were shifting like by the minute. So everybody was trying to gather as much research and data as they possibly could. And we were as well. And, and it was interesting because I think frankly, it wasn't necessarily having such a, a dramatic effect on how we would um, essentially execute our program, but it was really allowing the conversation to unfold with our client partners around how we should be thinking about it. Also engage new sales opportunities. Because if you look at sort of the world in which we live, COVID was you know, a bit of a softer period and we really needed to go out into the marketplace and be able to leverage consumer research to start conversations and build new relationships. The other half of it is measurement, is sort of performance, right? So from in our business, a lot of the work we do is not necessarily retainer, right? It's not like year over year, we have a three or five year contract, et cetera, et cetera. It's project based. So we have a fixed period of time in which we need to basically substantiate the performance of that program. So we'll be very deliberate around what we measure, how we measure it, how we're doing, and be able to pivot in real time so that we can actually have an effect. So if something's working, let's do more of it. If something's not working, let's pivot and let's reallocate some of those resources to the things that are. Um, and we test everything to make sure that that messaging or that approach or whatever is working. So we have sort of that fixed period of time in which to actually be effective. So we need to be have real visibility into the data and what, it's, uh, what the work is doing for us. I, I just add, you just mentioned the, the insights. And you know one of the reasons that I became part of this larger organization, Finn, is they have a whole global insights group. And those tools are expensive. They cost a lot of money, yes, they right? Are. But they're uh, powerful. I mean, I could have somebody out in our New York office run reports right now to tell me, you know, what, what are people talking about? Are they liking L.L. Bean or are they not liking L.L. Bean? What don't they like? What are they saying about North Face? What are they saying about Patagonia? And the conversation is happening in the digital world. And we can track it. We can understand it. We can know sentiment. We can know who's talking about what. So understanding those trends is really, really important. And that's great data for insights. And that changes an ongoing basis. And you have to, it's not a one, it's, it's not a one moment in time. You have to look at this moment, look at it in a month, look at another month. So that's one type of data. SEO, what are people searching for? What are the keywords that people care about? What's driving people to websites? So there's so much data out there that can give you really smart insights that drive good creative, drive good messaging. Um, that's, that's critical stuff. Which social listening tool are you utilizing? Oh, God, I knew you were going to ask that. Sorry. I don't, I, I, I don't even know because okay. they use a bunch, and yeah. I let them kind of do it, and then they give me the report. Yeah. No, <laughs> so, no, no, no worries. And no then worries. I ask them a lot of questions, and no I ask. No worries, no worries. I, Mel, would Meltwater sound right? I'm not sure. There's, there's, a, there's a bunch of them. So. Yeah. Probably, yeah. yeah Infigy is another one I think they yeah, might use. Yeah, Brandwatch right. or right, Crowd so, Social. Or, yeah, yeah, so. There's a ton of them. I was just curious because we're evaluating one to use yeah. here. So. I can get back to you. I can ask our head of global <laughs> no, insights. Yeah, so, so um, uh, yeah, so you also mentioned something about uh, Google doing away with the third-party cookies. What are you guys going to do now without third-party cookies, or did you even rely on them, and how are you building first-party data so that you're eliminating the need for that? Well, Google, Google announced they're going to do it, but I don't think they've announced how they're doing it yet. Yeah. Um, that's my understanding. Like, this, it, it falls into the media department there. So I know when, when, um, when iOS made their change, it just, you know, we had to look at other ways to target. So I, I don't, I, I, I'm probably not the best person to, I'd have to call on our media folks to do that detail. But. Yeah, we have a team that probably focuses on this more than me, but what I, what I feel about it is like, um, you're, we're really going to have to start to earn people's data, right? Um, we have, like when we do a campaign, we have people create a Red Bull account, a login, and then they're part of the world of Red Bull, and hopefully as being part of the world of Red Bull, they're getting, they're getting something right, whether it's um, a special offer or VIP, like access to something, right? Um, we're giving them some sort of benefit that makes them want to keep coming back. And you see brands like Nike that do this really well. They have a huge, uh, you know, their, their, uh, their app and the things they offer their consumers. Um, there's a lot of value being, you know, a member of, of Nike, for example. So I think that's something that we're doing as a brand is building that first party data. It's like in its infancy. Uh, I think a lot of brands are starting to do that, though. And ultimately, if you build that relationship with the consumer, they're going to want to give you their data because they know they're going to get something in return. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, the only thing I would say, for us, it's not such a huge area of our business. We yeah. can do it and we have done it, but we're not reliant on it. You know, from a media perspective, there's just higher value media channels and opportunities that are more sort of exclusive to the audiences that yeah. we're working with that we can tap into that aren't reliant on that, and that's where we focus. Otherwise, it's just, you know, from a, 
you know, revenue and a profitability standpoint, we just can't compete. Yeah. No, I, and I think, you know, maybe more from a brand perspective, and that's really my background as yeah. well, it's building really first-party data that is probably the key to that, and there's lots of, lots, lots of great ways to do that. Um, we're in marketing, all of us, and we get a lot of cool tools and technology. What are you utilizing to help drive engagement? And, you know, you talked a little bit about the beginning, about part building partnerships, or we briefly about social listening, or you might have, um, you know, some global strategies. What are some ways that, or some things that you're utilizing that are just fun players? Maybe uh, I, we call it interactive digital, so making your ads and, and your, your content more interactive, and we're lucky as marketers, like that's where it's fun, where we can be like really creative, and um, whether it's creating aug augmented reality ads on um, Instagram or Snapchat, um, or hashtag challenge on TikTok, where you're actually like, creating with your consumers. Um, we're working on uh, consumer activation right now, where people can go online, use this tool, and create the basketball court of their dreams. And then we're, we're actually going to build that court um, in Boston. So, like, giving people ways to like co-create with us as a brand, and I think that's a lot more fun than like two-dimensional, just basic ads, right? Um, that interactivity is is key, and people want want that from a brand. They want to like interact and engage. Um, and as a marketer, I think that's like where we can add, we're all like data nerds up here, but um, I think we also love like to flex our creative muscles and have fun with our consumers and engage with them. And um, that, I think those, we're lucky those platforms exist and the technology exists to do those things. And it's not even as expensive as it used to be to do a, an ad in AR or whatever you, you might see that's innovative. So, so you're um, experimenting with the metaverse? Not, not yet. Uh, I did just listen to like a, a whole podcast on the metaverse because I was trying to wrap my head around around it, and there's going to be so much cool things that can be done there. Um, it's could really, like really interesting. Miller Light, where you set up a Red Bull bar, and you could, you could, yeah. I mean, this meeting could be in three in the three dimensional web. We could all be avatars right now, or not, not right, in real person. Exactly. Who says we're not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone else? Any cool? I, I think there's a lot you can do online. I think when I, when I think about all, uh, engagement, it's not about advertising. Like, I hate when people call us an advertising agency because at the end of the day, advertising is old. Like, we're in the, and I, I actually hate the storytelling business too because that is like so cliche. But at the end of the day, we're, 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 we're building relationships with people, and that means nurturing relationships as well. And that means we're not, we're not selling to them all the time. It's about content. It's about entertaining them. It's giving them things. And the more you entertain them, the more they will like it, the more they will share it, the more they will tell their friends. And I don't think it all, like, our, our instinct these days is always to go online. And, of course, that is, like, it spreads really rapidly. But I, I, I say to people all the time, one of my favorite viral marketing um, uh, campaigns ever goes back to, me, well, you know, we guys are going to remember, Filene's Basement, which is, like, uh, thank you. Filene's Basement was this um, kind of a... Uh, secondhand store in, in downtown crossing and their bags and it was a you know you got really great discounts and the bags just say I just got a bargain mm -hmm. and people walked around Newberry Street and all over Boston with a bag that said I just got a bargain it was free advertising for Filene's basement so I to me like that was a brilliant like you know they didn't have brown bags they didn't just say Filene's basement on it instead it was like their pure message I just got a I just got a, a, a bargain and so I think we have to think that way. It's not just about digital. It, brands still live in the physical world. I know we're just talking about the meta world, and I'm sure that's gonna it's it's gonna be huge. Um, so, but you know, we still also live in the physical world. So I, I always I'm always encouraging our team. Yes, think about digital, but how does it actually happen in real life as well? Great. Any other? I would just build on that and say uh, there are lots of trends that sort of emerge and give you the opportunity to engage, and that are um, you know. Some survive, some don't last all that long. But I think for us, you know, what's really important is having a foundation. That really is our business model. It's this sort of ideas and access model. So you basically say access. You have a venue and an ecosystem where you can activate brand partners and clients, and you have really good ideas. And if you put the two together, the, the idea is that it actually works, and you're able to engage people. And so we are hyper-aware of those things that are trending from a, a trends perspective and trying to leverage those as best we can, but not being married to those such that we are so leaned into something that it may not actually survive the, you know, the, um, the way they would need to.
sure everyone has time to, to basically have sort of like a really um, sort of foundational approach to reaching these consumers on an ongoing basis. But largely like the venue for it and the quality of the idea is what has really been successful for us over time. I think there's one, one thing to add on like the metaverse and all these new areas, NFTs or all these new things that are trending right now is just like as a marketer to be, to be curious, to learn about it. I mean, we don't know what the metaverse is gonna be or how impactful it's gonna be on brands, right? But um, learn about it, experiment. Like there's, you can have a lot of fun in that space. Um, I think Matt was saying, you don't necessarily need to lean all in on it just because it's trending, um, right? It's just being curious and exploring and uh, test and learn and then, you know, you're ahead of it when, you know, you don't want to be the last one to, to be a part of something that is critical as a marketer to be a part of, but, um, you know, you don't have to be the first either. You can sort of learn and, and explore and figure out where your space is or where your, the space is uh, for your brand in that area, so. I will say that the NFT space is pretty cool. I'm actually How many NFTs do you own? Zero. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think the other thing is just be authentic and be inclusive. So, you know, a, a lot, like real people and if encourage, like have, like when, whenever we do campaigns for clients with real customers in it, those customers are like so happy to be in that ad. They're sharing with it, and they have like, "Hey, did you see that my husband Lee was in this ad?" And it was like, it's really cool. And it's like, it just, I think people love to talk about like, the, like who here wants to be in an LL Bean social post? Yeah, right? everybody, yeah, everybody, right? Everybody. Cool. And how many of you are gonna say, "Hey, tell your friends that you were in an LL Bean social post," and you just now it's like you got to share it. It's like, hey, did you see this? Like they had me in that post. Like that, so the more you include real people and, and include your audience in your campaign, the more they're going to share it. And by the way, the more loyalty you get to them as well. Yeah, like, the, wow, I'm part of the family. The ultra marathon story was, was so cool. I want to I wanna run with her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah right. that I was mean, a cool story. And I bet the entire company's talking about that, right? It's like, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, so as an industry leader, what do you find most rewarding about your job and where are the pain points? So my job is the most amazing thing ever because every day I go in and whether I'm proofing a tweet or whatever, I'm not sure I don't proof tweets, but anyway, um, you're changing someone's life. And in my case, I get to change several someone. We impact something like 25,000 people in the state of New Hampshire and about another 10 in Vermont. And when you think about the fact that there are about a million sick people in New Hampshire and a normal circle of influence based on our sociological study that I wrote about. Darden's number if you want to look it up. 150 people are in your circle. So if everybody in the state of New Hampshire that we touch has 150 people in their circle, we've more than covered the state of New Hampshire. And that gets me up in the morning. And then the pain point is, why aren't y'all giving me more money? <laughs> Donate now. Donate now. Click the click the animation. East Deerfield, New Hampshire. Um, what else? Um, I think for me it's creativity. I, I love to be able to think. We call it big ideas at Red Bull, but you see a lot of the big things that the big ideas, the the viral content that we push out, or the big event that we do that takes over a whole city. Um, we build all that stuff in house, so we don't actually we we say build not buy. We don't actually. Uh, pay an agency to come up with our ideas or our wow. events or our athlete projects. It's uh, built by my team and the other teams around the country. So to me, like, you can dream up these amazing ideas, um, you know, someone jumping from outer space um, and setting the, the world record for uh, free fall from outer space, right? Like, that was an idea that came internally from, from Red Bull, Red Bull Stratos, for example. Um, so that the idea that you can dream big and come up with these big ideas and then it's kind of scary when they get approved. You're like, okay, now we got to go do this. Um, but that's really, really rewarding. And then I'd say the people that I get to work with, the culture in marketing, you're surrounded by so many creative, inspirational people, people that are just passionate about life um, and the culture um, where I work and probably a lot of other great brands is, is really special and gets me out of bed every morning. The pain point, I would say, is probably just the, the pace at which things change, especially during the pandemic. We build these business plans and I spend the whole you know, half a year building our business plan and then the whole thing changed. And it was like, okay, so we pivoted. And we pivoted again and we pivoted again. It's kind of like, it gets exhausting, but I think in those cases, maybe I need to um, get outside a little bit. That's <laughs> 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 right. Um, calm down a little bit. But there are those moments where it gets stressful because, yeah, technology, the, the industry, the trends, it's, it's all very fast paced and it can get 
uh, exhausting and uh, to keep up with everything. So that's probably the biggest pain point. Yep. So, oh, um, I, I think for me, it's just two things that get me excited. One is from an operation from running the agency, just watching people succeed. Like, I love when people call me after a meeting and be like, we just had this great client meeting. They love the work. I mean, that's like, there's nothing that gets me happier than that. When people just, they feel great about the work they're doing. And um, that's, and just watching them grow, and watching them get better. And, you know, my role is just really to help them and help just be that. So that's really exciting to me. And the other piece, you know, I talked about the moral of the story and helping brands find their soul is like really meaningful to me. Like um, whether it be for-profit companies, we actually, um, as part of us giving back, I invite one nonprofit into the agency one of these days on Zoom. Um, you ask me what the negative is, I, I have to go to another Zoom call and shoot someone. So, <laughs> uh, especially after six o'clock. Um, but, you know, but having nonprofits uh, we, we do like a free half day moral session for them. We have them come in and we, we just listen. I mean, we have a whole process we go through to find the soul of their, of their brand. And, you know, to see these brands, like literally I, there's hugging, there's crying that happens to these because oftentimes these nonprofits were founded by someone who they started this thing because something happened in their life. Like most nonprofits were started because something bad happened. Right, and and then they went, and then they forget. They, like five years later, they forgot about that. It's all about we got to raise money. We have to get these people, and they kind of forget why they did it. And when you kind of take a moment to get back to that, it's really heartwarming. And it's heartwarming for me to to be a part of it and help the client. But it's also heartwarming for me to see the people that I work with recognize right there that is why we do what we do. We're helping brands actually go back to their heart. And 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 once you find that. That's when you can be authentic. That's when you can share who you are. And there's, like, there's almost nothing more fulfilling to me than that. So. Great. Um, the things that have been most exciting for me uh, in Riddle and Bloom, the first one, just by far and away, is I work in a really cool company. We have an awesome team of people. So it, you, know, you can describe it as the culture and, and who we are and what we do, but it, it is really the people. And we have an amazing group of people that I've been fortunate to work with. We have grown that group significantly over the past several years, so it's awesome to share that with more people. Um, the second piece that's most exciting for me alongside that is when I get to hang out with these cool people, we get to do cool things and solve business challenges. Not just like you know, sort of creative solutions or marketing strategies or, or what have you, but legit business problems that brands have and organizations have in reaching and engaging and converting this audience. Like, that's fun for me. But then you get some data and nerdy stuff and then all that. But like, that's interesting. And that's what like jazzes me. Um, I would say that the thing that's been challenging is like, is, um, is finding good talent. Honestly, like we're growing and it's a really good thing, but growth is also very hard. And when you're growing, you're thinking about how you structure an organization, what roles do you need, what type of people do you need? And generally when the labor market is kind of in a, in a challenging spot as it is right now, trying to find those people in the time frame that you need to do that is really challenging. So I talked to a couple of folks out in the, the sort of recruitment area there and it's, it's a really good market for you all right now and it's an exciting market. And when you think about Boston where we are, as an agency, there's lots of other agencies in, in Boston area and other great cities around the U.S. right now that are competing for great talent. So you, you're in a good spot. Uh, come work for Riddle and Bloom. But um, we're smaller. <laughs> Do the animation. I need a web person, by the way. We are on the hunt for good people. All right, I'm going to do one quick question because then I'm going to turn it over to Q and A. So just a quick answer: If you could do college all over again, and knowing what you know now, what would you change, if anything? Well, I guess I can start. We'll go this way. Um, I would say just take advantage of more things like this. Honestly, I think when I got to UNH, I signed up to be a part of a lot of clubs and different activities on campus, but I was like maybe a passive member to some of the things. I didn't necessarily like go and attend these sort of speaking engagements and networking events, and there's just like, you're surrounded by all these amazing opportunities to constantly be learning and building your network and your sphere of influence on, on campus and beyond. So. I would just take advantage of more. I think I was juggling school, work, multiple jobs, um, and, and the social element that's important too. But um, I probably would even do more than I did because there's so much available here. And especially now seeing how the business school has grown to what it is today, it's like there's more than there ever was even when I was here uh, back in 09. So go get it. So I am the lone non-alum, so I can't say. Um, You're still welcome here. Thank you, I appreciate that. We're but, adopting you. Well, I appreciate that too, but honestly, my answer is completely forthright and completely sincere. 
seeing the level of integration of the of the faculty with the yeah. student body, I know that I did not take good enough advantage of that relationship at my institution, and I would I would go back and change that because clearly, I, I think I came to college way long ago thinking I had to make it. I had to do it myself, and I had to go it alone, and that was wrong, and I probably would be in a, I mean, I'm very happy with where I am in life, but I would be differently pl placed in life if I had approached that faculty relationship differently. Yeah, I, so I don't know if it's a regret, but I, I would say when I was a, uh, when I was a junior at UNH, I'm a drummer, and I basically just left campus every Thursday, Friday, Saturday night to play in a band. And so, I mean, it was their full-time job, and I was, you know, leaving after class and going all around New England, mostly playing at Chinese restaurants, which is kind of weird. <laughs> and so that was my entire junior year. And, you know, while it was a really fun and cool experience, I feel like I missed, like, a really critical year of UNH. And, um, and, and what I learn now and what I tell every client is relationships are everything. And... I think you're here to learn, but you are here to build relationships with everyone. Every one of these people in this room around you is like, is your future. And so I think I missed the year of opportunity of really building those relationships where uh, to know more people, to, to build those relationships. You know, and, and by the way, at the time, we didn't have Facebook and LinkedIn. So we left UNH and you know, we wrote letters, right? I mean, now it's like, oh, let's just connect on Instagram and we'll be friends for life. So you have a little bit of an advantage there. But that's kind of, just remember, you're, you're here to learn, but you're here to build relationships and do that and be kind to people. You know, be, be, you know, be a good person. Be nice. And um, that goes a long way. So, anyway. Uh, I would say the, the one thing that I didn't do, which I wish I did do, and this is totally unrelated to career development or what have you, I actually wish I studied abroad. I talked to a bunch of people who, uh, UNH alum, who did go abroad, and they had an incredible experience. Yeah. I was like, damn, what did I miss there? But... Not that I would want to leave you in each campus, but it's, a, it's an incredible opportunity that the university offers. So if you can, you have the chance to do it, I would say go for it. Um, I, so more career development for professionally oriented. I actually got the chance to come back to UNH. I went to, I uh, did the MBA program a few years after graduating from undergrad, and I got to do the thing that I didn't really do in undergrad, which was really build relationships with faculty. In the MBA program, there are some amazing faculty that I was really able to connect with and learn from, and that I still talk to to this day. And so uh, the, those relationships, the education, the networking, the value of the community in UNH in general, and you see it here, is just, it's unbelievable. So um, I, I recommend staying connected. I recommend being proactive and connecting with those individuals, having conversations, going up to them and introducing yourself, connecting on LinkedIn. It works, trust me. It may feel a little bit awkward or, or sort of uh, nerve-wracking at the time, but like a commitment to it actually works over time. It's fantastic. Great. I'm going to open it up to Q&A. So I'm going to have my, uh, my girls come forward. Once again, I want to thank you guys for spending the time with uh, us here today. Uh, I wanted to ask um, more directly towards the agency side of it over here, but open it up to you guys as well. Um, I know that the key thing about marketing is asking the right questions, and I want to know what are some of the questions that um, you guys see on the agency side that you have to ask when you get a new client or when you work with these clients that you're seeing more and more uh, in recent years and maybe into the future as well. One word, why? That's it. I, I tell clients, I, excuse me, I'm going to act like a 10-year-old in this meeting. And I might ask a question, but I'm going to ask you why 20 times after that. Because, you know, why do you get into this business? Well, because my old up boss sucked and I want to start my own business. Like, that's you. Right? It's like, well, why, why did, did you not like what the old boss was doing? Well, and the more you ask why, there's a, I think it's um, Toyota, it's not a, a, right? The Toyota thing is like five whys. And because you don't get to you don't get to the heart of the problem until you ask why five times. Um, sometimes it's four, sometimes it's seven, but just keep asking why. And as in, I, I I always apologize for being annoying, <laughs> but why? And I think it's kind of the best same vein of why, but really like being super crystal clear on what the the overall objective is, because you oftentimes what you'll find is. 
the person that you're talking to at that particular point in time may have a very different perspective or be in a different role than somebody else that has a much different perspective on what the overall objective is. And when you start to go down a path and you build a, a program or a container or an initiative and find out two or three weeks later that that wasn't actually the original intent, and somebody steps in and says, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? So really being crystal clear and gaining alignment across all of the stakeholders and what you're doing to make sure that you're actually rallying sort of the right resources and, and sort of thinking around what, what you're sort of being charged with doing. And by the way, that, that gets passed along to the people who are actually working on the business, right? If, if you find out all that stuff and then you say, all right, well, here, we need a logo and, it, you know, and here's kind of the requirements, but you don't explain to the person why they're doing it, they're not, they're not going to do as good of a job. So it's, they really need to understand the why as well. So you put your heart into it when you, when you know that. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, I have a quick question for Little and Bloom. I know you work a lot with experimental marketing and campus ambassadors. How has that changed over the past two years with the pandemic, and how have you been able to work upon that? That is a great question. Uh, it kind of goes back to that whole model that we didn't really ever want to test the hypothesis that community existed outside the walls of a college campus. And it really tested our position, right? Sort of that audience-focused model. Um, we were really lucky. We were able to pivot because we don't go to market and say we're an experiential agency. We are a social media agency. We're an ambassador agency. We're an audience-focused agency that connects brands with its audiences through news channels and tactics, et cetera, et cetera. So when that happened, we shifted. We shifted a lot of our efforts to social and digital. Uh, we actually created some products. We created a, a virtual fitness challenge and some virtual runs by way of our partnership. And we went in that direction. It was a softer year for sure, but profitability-wise, we actually did fairly well because the, uh, the cost of sales structure was much different when you're not doing physical things. Um, and one of the big things for us that was really important it was we didn't want to lose anybody. So we, we didn't lay off a single person. And we sort of sit, we, you know, we grinned and bared it, and we got through. And we joke, and, and my counterpart Jill is in the room here, we joke about this term slingshot. Uh, and it's become a drinking game wherever somebody says it, you have to take a shot. But basically, we have been sort of promoting this idea of slingshotting, and we were 100% correct. We came out of 2020 and had our strongest year in 2021 yet, and are on track to do the same. And we have built up capabilities and new products that we didn't have before that we are now introducing into our product portfolio for our clients, um, which has really been really incredible. Hello. Um, so in my experience, marketing leaders have a Salesforce or CRM dashboard they look at every single morning right when they wake up if they can. What would you say are the top three metrics you look at on a daily basis? So I'm probably not, we, we actually don't have a CRM system we, we use at Red Bull regionally. Um, so I'd say like, but if, if you want to, to be able to answer the question, um, yeah, so I would say our sales data, like just the track daily, right? That's like short term, what's happening? We use IRI, yeah, we use IRI, so we track sales, share, um, how, you know, all the way down to the SKU level, what each each product is doing. Um, and that, you know, we see, um, you know, what, what happens every single month and what's driving those, uh, our sales and our share each month and what our competition is doing. So we look at that um, daily, weekly, you know, we, I'd say every four weeks we do a deep dive um, so those are the kind of things. Some of the other consumer insights I spoke about, um, like the marketing funnel, we look at that like uh, four times a year. So it, it's more over time, right? And we look at that more as the trend versus, um, you know, what's happening in, in one round of data. One, uh, you know, you might see something dip, but you really want to look at the trend because those things take longer to uh, move the needle. So. You sell oh, yeah. They're a huge customer. Yep, yeah, so we have IRI data, but then we have uh, specific customers that give us their, their data that we might have to purchase from them, right? But there's um, plenty of sales data across all the different channels that we do business in. What if that Walmart is able to use their data to look at and you can actually go in and see what the consumers are buying, not only your brand, but what else is in their shopping cart? Yeah, they can give you a lot of information. and Yeah, and they have... Um, 
their own like ad, ad buy systems as well on and off site media that you can buy based on their sales data. So it's really interesting. Uh, I'll answer that, but it's not daily. I, I think because I'm, I'm running the agency, so what our cli our, every client is different, what matters to them and what their conversions are and all that. But I will say from an agency perspective, I have a weekly leadership team meeting. And the two, two things I want to know is client status, client happiness and employee happiness. That's, that's really what matters to me. And so I'll ask, like the head of relationship management knows to come in with like one through five for every client, how happy are they? And I want to know that, right? And, and I need to know that on a weekly basis because by the way, it's not a client at two and I got to call them, a client's at five and I got to call them because if I got to only call them when they're at two, that's going to be a problem, right? Well, so I want to make, what, right, exactly. five, right? well, right. Well, I mean, I, w I want to make sure we're building the relationship while they're happy and then I get, you know, when, when things aren't, then I'm there, but also the employee piece of that, right? How is morale? And by the way, that's been tough. Like employee morale over the last two years, like people working from home and the pandemic and, you know, and like, if, if, but another thing, like if I happen to have another meeting about when are we going to go back to the office? I don't know. <laughs> right? It's like, well, I think we need to go back next month. It's like, no, but then the Omicron comes out. So yeah, I think that's, that's really challenging. And from, like, as I said earlier, people are everything. So that it's not just about client happiness. It's about employee happiness. Yeah, the um, checking in on your people is huge because there's just been so much like trauma over the last few years, and every day it's like whiplash. Every single week, there's some some horrible news story. So, um, and then like our business is on fire, and we're so busy. You talked about like just the we were talking at lunch like how busy uh, your teams are right now. So it's just checking in like, are you okay? Do you need a break? Like just being empathetic as a marketing leader and understanding how your team is feeling, and um, you know being flexible and actually listening to them um, and not just caring about the business is, is really key. So that's something, if, if you're not looking at that every day, you're not a good marketing leader. Other questions? Uh, I, don't know, like, uh, <laughs> I have a question for Jeff. Uh, just in your many years at Red Bull, what has been your favorite marketing event that you guys have been a part of? Oh man, that's a good question. There's so many, so many things. <laughs> um, let's see. I'll give you an example, um, just an event we did. Uh, we said we create a lot of our events in-house, or all of our events in-house, but um, we had this one of our um, four-wheel athletes, um, Pro 4 Truck Racing, had an idea to um, do the first ever truck race on snow. Uh, this one's pretty close to home because the event was actually at Sunday River in Maine. But um, he's like, what if we spike the tires and what do you think these trucks can even drive on snow? No one had ever done it. So we um, worked at BF Goodrich, we spiked put like over a thousand spikes in these tires and um, tested out what they could do on snow and lo and behold, they could do, they, they ripped, they could do like 100 miles uphill, great control. So uh, it was like a content piece in year one where we just, um, it was like a demo, right? What could this truck do? It was really cool, crazy music, posted online. Uh, and then we were like, hey, what if we turn this into a race? Uh, so it became side-by-side -side racing. Uh, we built the whole track at Sunday River in Maine, not too far from here. And um, it was amazing. It was actually filmed uh, with like a Cineflex helicopter for NBC, and it turned it went from this like little idea that like an athlete had that was like a phone call and a napkin drawing to like a full-on uh, NBC broadcast race um, on snow, and that was really cool. And something about like these trucks racing 100 miles an hour up a mountain was uh, was really cool in our backyard. So just one really cool I'm story. I'm just gonna say that's a guy thing. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably. Uh, we, we have a mantra like do don't just talk at um, or that's one of our our leaders in uh, the business unit that I'm part of so it's like you can sit around and talk about being inclusive in your marketing all day but it's just you just have to go do it or if you say hey we're gonna do, have big ideas um, we talk about we talk about big ideas all the time but you know there's you know a handful of people that actually do it and like take a risk and um, try to do something that's super innovative or um, unique. So do not just talk. is It's very simple, but um, there's a lot of talk. We, we have meetings all the time. Um, we're on Teams all the time, Zoom. Um, but it's also like, hey, just go, go do it, you know? Um, 
So mine is, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. Yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, it, one that just we talked about all the time is work hard, play nice. That's kind of. I have like thousands of these, and since you asked the question, I can't remember any of them. Exactly. <laughs> um, the one that is sort of a sort of a joke with my sales counterpart is we always talk about like, what if we sell this huge program or. How would we solve this problem? How do we do this? And we always just stop and say, create the problem first. And so it's a lot of times it's like we're the first ones through the wall because nothing, what we're talking about hasn't been done before. Um, but we're sort of unwilling and, and you know, unrelenting in the sense that we, we don't want to not do it. So we create the problem first. Great. Hello. I think it's working. So, Kevin Raymond, I'm actually in Professor Devine's class with Gwen. Uh, uh, yes, yes, indeed. So, <laughs> and uh, we, we've got a, a really tremendous group uh, pulled together here. Representation from L.L. Bean, Red Bull, Mr. Seals, Real Wood Food, uh, Smaller Meat Bins. Um, I actually work for Amazon, and we've got uh, millions of people now that have been displaced from the Ukraine. Um, they've agreed to match dollar for dollar that are raised by uh, folks who work for Amazon uh, to, to help that cause and, and to help those people that have been displaced. Um, one of the things that I've committed to doing, I'm actually going to start uh, running an ultra marathon tonight at 11 p.m. and not stop until right around when my homework's due in Professor Devine's class on Sunday. Um, so I think he I needs an to, extension. Yeah. <laughs> is that what this is about? <laughs> Um, so, yeah, one of the things I would ask just the, the panel, the group, um, any advice or, you know, anything that, that you guys can help uh, do to, to get that word out um, to, to help the, the folks in Ukraine and, um, you know, potentially, you know, help you with that, that effort of matching that dollar for dollar that Amazon would make. Uh, is there a group? Is there a group for this, um, for this event? I mean, do you have a... How are you promoting it? Yeah, so I mean, right now it's going to be posted on LinkedIn uh, later tonight as I think it's launched. I think the posts are pulled together and maybe on Instagram. I think uh, pitch pitch local media. That's like a uh, great like get some some earned coverage. I mean, it's an interesting story of what you're doing. It's a hot topic in media, so the media is talking about the Ukraine almost 24/7. So um, share your story, um, obviously on campus, but if you can get um, the local media to talk about it, that's where stuff starts to go viral. And I see like stories on the news all the time that I'm like, that just like hit me and I'm like, I need to donate. I need to go on GoFundMe or whatever the website is. So, so if you give me a little pitch, I'll get up the W and more folks. Boom, you're going to be on Channel 9 News tonight. <laughs> yeah, but also just send, send your post to this, I don't know if it's an email or, or a way to get this to everyone and just have them click and share it. I mean, if everyone here shared with their 150 or 200 already covered people. covered the state of New Hampshire. And I would also add whatever your story is, like why you're moved to do this. I mean, I think we can all, from an intellectual standpoint, understand the humanitarian suffering and the toll that this is taking. And also, oh my God, one more thing? Aren't we done yet? But if you have a personal connection or if you just, why you were moved. I know you said storytelling is passe, but it really, it really sells the deal to me. Um, like that's, that, that we, that's our bread and butter at Easter Seals. We have to tell you why you should help us help you know, Sue or Stephen or Peter or whatever. And thank you. And hydrate. <laughs> thank you all so much for a great first panel. Um, Following this, we'll have our second panel with some recent UNH alum. It was so insightful to hear everything you guys had to say. Thank you.
Hi everyone, my name is Abby Tatro and I am the director of Paul College's collegiate chapter of the American Marketing Association, which is a component of MAC. We're about to begin our marketing professionals panel, but before we do so, I would like to, to take the time to introduce our panelists. On our panel, we have four fairly recent UNH alumni who are here to discuss their careers and provide their recommendations for making the most out of your UNH experience. I am pleased to introduce Nicole LaCory, a senior associate of brand um, experiences for Wayfair, Kelly Nudd, an associate manager of consumer insights at Hershey, Julia Pelosi, a senior paid social specialist for Tenuity, and finally, Haley Studley, a media analyst for Chewy. I'm now going to hand it off to Lexi Houghton, who will be moderating this panel today. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. All right, so today we have a fabulous group of Paul alums here. Welcome back, first of all. And we are so fortunate to have you all here today and the array of brands and marketing professions in this room. Um, from social media ninjas to data-driven detectives to media mavens and brand and consumer enthusiasts, all from well-known brands and all Wildcats, of course. So thank you all for coming today. I'd like to start off with one or two sentences, just telling us your name, your company, and your role in that company. Sorry, um, my name is Haley Studley. I currently work for Chewy. It's one of the biggest e-commerce uh, company, and I'm a media analyst on their performance marketing team. My name is Julia Pelosi. I graduated from UNH in 2017. I work for Tenuity, which is the largest independently owned um, ad agency across the triopoly of social media, Facebook, uh, social media, um, Google, and Amazon. Um, currently, I am a senior specialist on the paid social team, so I manage the strategy for three clients um, on paid social. I'm Nicole Corey. I work at Wayfair, the furniture e-commerce company. Um, I am specifically focused on our brand experiences team and, and segmented to our Wayfair professionals, so B2B side of the business. So looks a bit different than the, the consumer side, but um, definitely working and building our brand there. And my name's Kelly Nudd. I work for the Hershey Company. I'm repping Reese's with my bright orange. <laughs> um, I am on the Consumer Insights team. I'm an associate manager. And my role primarily allows me to support innovation across the Reese's brand as well as the Hershey's brand. Awesome. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, so just also go into it, just like drive us through a typical day for you and just some pain points that you've experienced over your day. Like, what's most rewarding about your job and say what do you not like? Um, so my typical day, I kind of play two roles. I'm a media analyst and a media buyer. So in the beginning, I kind of pull a lot of reports as an analyst would. But I also get the after effect of media buying. So I'm also working with a bunch of networks like CNBC, Fox, National Grid, and all that. And I'm currently buying spots on that. So far, I love my job. Um, the one pain point I would say is my career has been fully remote since I graduated. So I definitely and missing by in-person experience. But other than that, we communicate on Slack and Zoom, which is nice that we have that, but definitely would love to get into office soon. Um, yeah, so for me, my typical day is sort of managing um, my internal um, people that I work on teams with. So, um, you know, just making sure that like all of our tasks and planning is done for the week for all of our clients. And then in addition to that, um, same as what you were saying, like sometimes pulling a little reporting, sometimes like client communications and things. And then in terms of like my favorite part of my job or why I like my job, um, I really like being able to help brands sort of achieve their goals. I also really like being able to leverage paid social to answer those big brand questions. Um, so that's what I like about my job. And then sort of pain points would be more so, um, I don't really know. I think that it's sometimes hard like on the agency side of things, like my clients change a lot. so. Um, while I do love getting to know their brand super well, it is sometimes tough to like pivot all of the time, but um, I think agility is really important in this field, so pain point, but also like a good thing. My day-to-day -day looks a little different depending on what I'm working on. Um, so it can range from calendar planning, what we are going to launch in the coming months. It could be focused on that specific campaign or content piece that we're building out. And then there is the layer of internal partners. So a lot of influencing, making sure there's alignment across our brand, marketing and sales teams, um, and, and really driving that cohesive marketing approach. Um, I think 
one of my favorite things about the job is getting to work with a lot of people and I think the being able to influence and, and being able to get teams to rally behind one one initiative is always rewarding. Um, the con, on the other hand, could be, and, and I know this came up in the last panel, but a lot of times plans pivot for various reasons. There could be a shift in, in the business priorities or initiatives that we need to be focusing on, so that could be a bit challenging when you are putting a lot of work behind one project and then have to shift to another, but always a great opportunity. Yeah, my day-to-day, -day, um, so I'm in consumer insights, so I lead consumer research for um, a number of different business partners across uh, the whole organization. And so my day-to-day -day is typically sitting in on um, team meetings to see how a project is progressing, um, you know, com communicating findings that we've, we've had from our research to our business partners and making sure that they really understand um, where the consumer is coming from. Uh, most rewarding for me is you know, the Hershey Company really values consumer insights, and that's not necessarily the case across um, other organizations. So for me, my role really does play a big part in um, a lot of critical marketing decisions. So that's obviously very rewarding to me. Um, it's also very rewarding to work for a company that just brings smiles to everyone whenever I say where I work or what I do. Everyone just instantly smiles, which is a lot of fun for me and makes me very proud. Um, I really, no cons really for this role that I'm in. You know, I'm pretty new to the role. I started in the summertime. Um, it has been challenging being remote. I work full-time remote in Maine. The whole company's in Pennsylvania, so um, missing a little bit of that kind of interaction with my teammates, but otherwise, um, nothing to complain about. <laughs> yeah, well, I definitely have to agree with uh, bringing the smile to your face for Hershey. Um, and Kelly, you know, you both touched upon how the pandemic has made you both remote currently. How has the pandemic changed the way you interface with your community and your consumers, and how have you been able to pivot your direction with that? Good question. Um, so should we still, like where I work in, we do commercials, and I guess with the pandemic, it didn't really affect our company in general. It actually skyrocketed at Chewy. Um, we actually had to stop TV commercials for a little bit of time because um, the demand was so big and large, uh, so they shut that off for a little bit, but it's now up and running. Um, but I guess, like, based off commercials, we do now try to relate them to the viewers, so they are more, I guess, like, home-based and based off current events, and that's how, like, we still engage with them. They're all, like, pet lovers. That's the company is a pet company, so we just base it off of pet owners and keep it relevant to what they see and want for their pets. Yeah, my roommate um, has a pet, so she has chewy box every other <laughs> yeah, week. Yeah, the blue boxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that for me, so this was actually two years ago, right at the start of the pandemic, so I was not at Tenuity. I was at a different agency that no longer exists, but one of my clients at that time was Custom Inc. And if you think about a company like that, nobody's buying their team's t-shirts. There's no soccer teams to buy jerseys for. And they looked at us two 25-year-olds running their social media and said, what do we do? And so for a while, we're like, oh, we scale back spend or we, you know, make these changes. And then one of us looked at the other one and we're like, what if we customize masks? And we were like, oh, I don't know. We should ask. And that ended up taking their business and just absolutely turning it around. And I think that's one of the coolest parts of what I get to do is like, yes, my job description is to run your paid social, it's to run your conversion list studies, it's to tell you who your customer is, like, that's what my job description is, but I think where the real fun happens is where I get to be an extension of all these marketing teams and help them solve their, like, big business decisions, like, business problems by making these decisions. Um, so I think that was, like, probably my biggest pivot during the pandemic was um, helping clients navigate how to make sure that it was a profitable time for them, even if their business wasn't necessarily one like Chewy, where like it just took off in that way. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I, I think things definitely changed with our consumers on the B2B side of Wayfair when the pandemic hit. You know, we, we work with education um, segments. We also work with office segments, so a lot of companies were closing down or, or going remote, and that spend was shifting in different places. Um, so, so one thing we really um, got behind and championed behind was a new content series, which would be focused on highlighting our pros and letting them tell their stories, how they either recovered from the pandemic or were able to outfit their, their Airbnb or, or turn their property into a rental um, during that time. So it, it became something from the pandemic, but grew even more to us letting our customers. So 
real people with real projects and, and, and problems they're trying to solve tell the story for us. Um, and I think as we talk about and, and have in the past few panels, how do everyone wants to be, you know, sh sharing their story, and, and that's how you really relate to other people and other consumers. So that's been a positive for us. Yeah, and specifically for the consumer insights industry, you know, we're very used to conducting research in people's homes, meeting them in parks, you know, being out out and engaging with the consumers, and we needed to shift that totally to online. So we are now hosting interviews over Zoom. Um, rather than being face-to-face -face with the consumer, which is definitely challenging. Um, it's definitely a strong area of pivot for the whole industry, and I think you know, now a lot of the um, agencies that we work with have really become <coughs> very strong at that. Um, it's, been, you know, it's been a good pivot, I think. And, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I know we have all shared space in here over a year. You all are new and alum. Julia even mentioned having depressed anxiety going back into taking accounting tests in here. <laughs> I have sweaty palms thinking about it right now. <laughs> <laughs> but what over your time at UNHC really has helped you propel your career has also really prepared you for the career you have now? Um, I, this doesn't really like pertain to my like career specifically, but again, like group projects really helped a lot because you wouldn't expect it in the moment, but it helps with like team building. And I guess like sometimes in group projects you deal with like someone's kind of lacking a little bit and you have to pick up on that and that like does happen like in teams some people do leave and you will have to get more of a workload and I really found that to be a great experience even though in the time I didn't think of anything of it but coming into a job you do become more like you have to get more flexible with that and I feel like a group project specifically helps out with that and just like meeting deadlines and working with different personalities so I found that to be really rewarding at yeah. college and stuff, but. Yeah, I know Diane's always thrown us in group projects, and it hasn't always been the easiest <laughs> thing, but obviously the best thing for us, because it's taught us what we don't know. Yeah. 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 Diane did once call me out and said, you wrote this whole slide deck. Yep. You I'm were responsible that. for two slides. I was like, that's true. I did do that. <laughs> um, but I think that for me, truly the thing that UNH taught me was like, your full potential lives right at the edge of your comfort zone, and the more times you can make yourself uncomfortable, the better you'll be for it. Um, I think that a lot of the projects and real life experiences that Paul gave me in 2017, like I still think about those experiences now, and I still try to find ways like actively in my life now to like challenge myself to leave what I'm comfortable with because that only then like leads to growth. Yeah, I think a lot of the opportunity that came from Paul College and, and extracurricular activities was getting involved with real businesses or, or really going beyond the day-to-day -day classroom work. So whether you're working with a real business or you're planning an event like this, you're really getting that hands-on experience, not only for you to grow your skills, but then to take that to your interview or take that to your first role and, and build upon it even more. Yeah, ditto to all of that. <laughs> the team building piece was definitely a big one for me. Um, and just learning how to work on a team with such a diverse group of folks from different backgrounds, um, different experiences, but also remaining open to opportunities that you wouldn't necessarily think you might take um, was definitely a huge part for me. I you know, came into the, my career wanting to be in nonprofits and environmental studies, and I ended up doing an extracurricular here, um, the National Science Foundation i -Corps program, which was totally out of my comfort zone. It was something I convinced myself I had no time for, not enough experience for. Um, took that leap and did it, and that's really what got me into Consumer Insights. Um, the program was you know, leveraging community, um, folks in the community to see if an idea that we had would make sense, basically. So it was a little bit of Consumer Insights work, a little bit of science, two things I was passionate about. Um, and that really led me to the career that I'm in right now. So I'd say just you know, be open to any opportunities that you're, you're offered here, because there are so many. Yeah, absolutely. And on that point, what on the flip side do you wish you maybe got involved more on or maybe learned more that would help you in your career? If that's clubs, activities, or doing something in the classroom? Yeah, I would say taking advantage of these kinds of opportunities. Um, networking events, they're always a little uncomfortable and awkward, but just do it. <laughs> so beneficial. Yeah, and I think jumping in and, and getting more involved earlier on, I, I would say even for myself, I think I waited until halfway through college to really get involved and, and start to join clubs. But had I known that earlier on and the benefit it would have had, I think it would have propelled me even more. 
Um, and then I think another piece we've touched on is really growing that connection with faculty. Um, so I, I, I definitely stay in touch with a handful, um, but really leaning on them for that support and that real world experience that they have. Yeah, I think for me, it's tough. I and UNH was like my favorite experience, and like I, my friends make fun of me. They're like, "You never visit us at college," and I was like, "I did not leave Durham. Like that's where I was." <laughs> but I think for me, just like ditto to what you were saying, like I think that I would just get involved earlier. Like I do think that like I do still have meaningful relationships with faculty. I do still do all that stuff. I just wish that I had leaned in a little bit sooner. Um, yeah. Again, extracurricular activities. Definitely wish I partake took in more of those. Um, I'd also say classes, even if you're slightly interested in it, definitely take it. I wish I was more well-rounded with some of the marketing classes here that I didn't partake in, so go for it. Take as many classes as you possibly can and use those resources. Yeah, um, should have studied, we should have gone abroad. I don't know if anyone did, we should have gone abroad. I'm, I'm so jealous of that. <laughs> but we, we weren't, weren't leaving Durham. We weren't leaving Durham. <laughs> right, okay. True. Yeah, I thought about studying abroad, and I was like, oh my gosh, one semester away from Durham, I don't know if I can do it. And yeah, the like, FOMO. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then looking into starting a career in marketing, what key advice would you give the students here today and anyone else, absolutely, that they would help to propel their career, and what would differentiate them in the industry of marketing? I can start on this one if you want. Okay. I think, I think that in the same way as marketers, we have to ask our clients how to measure success. You have to ask yourself how you see success. So like for someone that could be a job with like an awesome salary, for someone else that could be a job where they get to learn, for someone else that's a job where they get to help people. So like what's your personal mission statement? And I know you're graduating college, you're like, oh my God, a mission statement, nobody told me about this. But like figure out what it is that makes you happy in your day-to-day -day life and try to figure out how that looks in a job. I tried and failed. <laughs> I'll be honest, I did. And it, it served me well, because like, that taught me what my mission was and like what I'm looking for in a job. So I think that, don't think about a job just as a job. Think about a job as something that like helps you serve that mission. And your job does not have to be your whole life, but you have to figure out, like what do I want my job to be for me? And will the role that I'm applying for or interviewing for help me achieve that? Yeah, I think to build on that too, companies always are looking for someone who's going to fit their culture, but at the same time, what is your point of view on culture? What do you want to get out of joining a company? Is it something that is a small startup and um, has a lot of younger employees, so you can you can grow with a network of, of employees there? Um, really defining that and knowing that going into it, I think even when you are in interviews and when, when companies are looking for you to join their culture, it will be obvious that you've, you've done your research and you do know what you want. In one of my interviews that I had, they were telling me, like, you can be taught a skill set, but you can't be taught a personality. So really fit your personality with that company. Like, you'll be able to tell right away if you fit with them or not. And, like, don't force it because you want to be happy with what you do. So just, like, kind of be yourself. And, again, a skill set in your resume is, like, paper. You just really try to fit yourself where you think you'll be, even if it's a company that you didn't think you would ever apply for beforehand. Yeah, similarly, I was going to say, you know, follow your passion for sure. Definitely don't settle. Um, same thing with culture. If it doesn't feel right, like, you, you don't have to be there forever. Um, but learn what you can. Every opportunity is a great opportunity. Um, and don't necessarily go hunting for your dream job, like, right off the bat. If an opportunity presents itself to you, it's not necessarily something you would have been interested in. Still consider it. Um, there's just so much to learn out there, and it can really help drive you to where you're meant to be. And when looking for landing a job, I know you all went through that process and you all probably realized how stressful it can be for everyone. Um, what was helpful for you and what was successful for you in the long run that made you land new jobs and land new jobs after college? Um, so I graduated right at like the beginning of the pandemic, so it was wicked tough, but um, it didn't really stop me. I mean, you're going to get a job, like, don't rush into anything, especially right away. Like, you have time. It took me a whole summer, honestly, after the pandemic. Um, but I just kept pursuing and, like, LinkedIn courses, kind of kept educating myself after that. Um, network also, definitely network. Don't feel uncomfortable, like, messaging someone. I was, like, very nervous to message someone, but, like, I saw at a company that I wanted to apply for to do it. They don't care. They honestly will love someone reaching out to them. 
So I feel like the main takeaway is like network, network, network. Yeah, I think in addition to that, tell your people that you're looking for a job. Like, tell your people. Tell your aunt, call your uncle you haven't talked to, your neighbors watering their plants, hey, I'm looking for a job. Like, you don't know who knows someone. Like, really, like, your network is LinkedIn. Your network is everybody that you encounter. So I think just having that knowledge out there can help. And then, uh, yeah, I completely agree. Like, reach out to people that work at the company. And don't just say, hey, I'm interested. Say, hey, are you happy day to day at your job? Do you like what you're doing? I'm graduating from college and looking for a job, and I'm more curious if this could be a good fit. Do you have 10 minutes to talk to me on the phone? Um, I did that many times, and I think avoided a lot of positions that wouldn't have been a good fit for me just based on, like, the feedback I got. Um, so, yeah, just do as much of that kind of, like, research and, like, conversational stuff as you can. Yeah, I think to, to build on everything we've said here and, and to your earlier point, be open to every opportunity. So don't just think, you know, I want to go into this industry or I want this specific position. It's, it's good to have those goals, but I think go beyond that. Um, so, so apply to every role that you think you might be interested in, and then you can go that next step to connect with people on LinkedIn that might be alumni that also work at that company and find out what their day-to-day -day is, find out um, what, what it really is to – in the culture and, and to be in that job position before you go through all of the rest of the steps. Yeah, and I'll just build briefly to say LinkedIn was definitely the most useful tool that I found while I was job searching, um, messaging people, you know, having that option open that you're open for a job so recruiters can contact you was definitely helpful. Um, and just cast a wide net because you never know what, what will come your way. <laughs> yeah, and the only thing I'll add too is like, let's say that you're interested in like high fashion. I think that a lot of times coming out of college, you're like, I'm only going to look at high fashion companies. But like, you could work at a high fashion company, or you could work at an agency that works with high fashion companies, or you could work at a publication that publishes high fashion companies. So just consider all your avenues, because like, there's more than one way to like achieve that. Yeah, and also take like every interview possible, even if it's a job that you really don't want. It's practice for that that you don't really get. It's like hard to teach that. So I would definitely take every single interview can have and also still um, reach out to your professors. I definitely did after college, so they're also a great network to keep in touch with. Yeah, that's actually a great point of using those interviews to practice because I feel like a lot of times we practice in classrooms, we practice at events, but it's so different when you get thrown in there. Um, so that was a great point. Thank you. And then, so if you were to do Paul College all over, you're a freshman right now, what would you change, if anything? I would take a class with Lee. I never took one with Lee. Neither have I. I should have. I did. It was great. <laughs> um, go to more networking events. I definitely was hidden for like freshman, sophomore year. I would start earlier and take advantage of all of those and clubs too. Yeah, ditto. And I was only here for a year. I did the year-long MBA program, so it was short and sweet. Um, but I definitely wish I had leveraged more of my uh, relationships with my faculty. I, you know, I'm connected with some of them on LinkedIn, but it would have um, been nicer to have a little bit of a closer connection uh, and eat in more JBs. <laughs> I think about JBs more often than I have to admit. <laughs> yeah, I think that for me, I would have had an internship, which I know is kind of a weird one because, like, definitely could have. But I think that at the time I was, like, schoolwork and I had a job and everything else. But I think that having an internship or having, like, any experience of that kind is super meaningful and helpful, especially when you're, like, trying to get that first job. So I think that's probably the thing I would have done differently. Yeah, it definitely can be, I was going to say, it definitely can be, like, overwhelming. I'm currently a senior, my second semester, working, getting internships, applying to jobs, and also having a group project for probably every class I'm in. Yep. So it just can be a lot sometimes. And so having internships in my current, like, future or beginning years was definitely helpful for me. Really just to, to build on all of that, I think those are, are great points um, around the networking piece, getting more involved. Um, so I think... Our, our advice here is to get involved and attend these type of events. <laughs> you guys are already here, though, so tell your friends that aren't here, I guess. <laughs> it's not good advice for you, I suppose, but... All right, we have one last question, and I guess it might be the most important question on the list. Diane added it. Um, <laughs> so when you think about a Thursday, Friday, or Thursday, Saturday night, where do you go, Libby's or Swerps? Because I feel like it's switched over this year, and I've... I think it's like every every year. Year. It definitely so switched weird. this year. <laughs> so what would you say? I would say Libby's. 
For me, because it's a Thursday, it's Scorps. Friday was Libby. Friday was Libby. Ooh. <laughs> Thursday is Scorps. Friday, Libby. I didn't even go to the Wednesdays is the knot. I don't even think that exists anymore. I was Quarter say the knot. the knot. No one talks oh. about the knot anymore. Yeah, the knot needs more clout, but. <laughs> Libby's, definitely. <laughs> Libby's. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I had a great experience talking to all of you. You have a wonderful career ahead of you, and thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to spend uh, with us today. Um, I wanted to ask a question for those that are a couple years out from graduating UNH. I wanted to know if, even at this point in your career, if you still keep all the stuff that you did on campus on your resume. I know that I'm personally pretty involved in everything I've done on, on campus during my time here. And I'm kind of wondering if that's just to get the first job out of college or if I can still put that on like a couple of years out and if people still even care about that. Yeah, I think it depends on your the career path you're trying to take. Um, so for my example, with the, the i Corps program that I participated in, I've kept that on because that's something that's super relevant to the career that I'm in right now. I don't think there's any hard and fast rule for, you know, if you have to have it there, if you have to take it off because it's something you did back in college. I think if it's relevant and it's an experience that you really learned from and gained a lot from, absolutely include it. I don't have anything from college on my resume currently, but to that point, that's exactly why, because none of it feel like I just feel like I have more relevant things to say now. I think that whenever you're doing a resume, you should look at the like the job you're applying for and just include those most relevant points. And if you're five years out of school and one of those most relevant points is from college still, there's absolutely no reason not to include it. But I don't think that there's a reason to include it just to have it. Thank you. So the, I guess our panel talks a lot about the competitive job market right now and um, how challenging it can be to find uh, great talent. So I'm curious how you found the companies that you worked at and where did, how did you connect with them in the first place? I can start with this one. I actually um, joined Wayfair through the career fair that UNH holds every year. Um, so I think, going back to all of our points, wasn't really looking to be at a furniture company or work in the e-commerce space, but after meeting with, with the company at the career fair, it was, it was very clear what their culture was like, what their mission was. Um, so that was really where, where the door opened for me, and being able to meet somebody and connect with them in person was, was really a, a, a good place. Go ahead. Um, mine was a very lucky find on LinkedIn. It was one of those in-app applications I submitted um, that I just got super lucky and got an interview for. Um, so while I will always preach that networking is so important, LinkedIn was what did it for me. <laughs> I have a bit of an interesting experience with my job. So during the pandemic, I was lucky enough to have the Dak Prescott injury where my foot was facing the wrong direction. I broke my ankle like bad. So I had to move home for a little bit. And while I was home, my current, the ad agency I was at was bought. And I was like, all right, this is a time where I like have to get out. But with everything else going on, I'll be honest, I took a job I shouldn't have taken. So I was working at an ad agency, really small, super unorganized, didn't have enough resources to really run a meaningful social program. I lasted six months. In the latter three months, I was like, I'm going to find the best social agency to work at ever. Like I was scouring ad agents, best places to work. I was scouring like the Inc, best places to work. And that agency I landed on was Tenuity because they were on all those lists. Because what became really apparent to me was like, this next job I take is not about the money that I'm making, which it ended up being like a flat switch, so that was fine. But it was like, it was not about the money, it was not about the title, it was not about the clients, it was about like, is this agency going to put its people first? Because the other thing that happened with agencies, as I'm sure some of you experienced and lived during the pandemic, is we were home and at our computers all the time, and that was not a secret. <laughs> like, people never stopped, you know, messaging us and stuff. And I think that there were certain agencies that said, well, you're around, so answer. And there were other agencies that said, set your boundaries, make sure that, like, you know, like, you take that time and space for yourself. And so what drew me to Genuity was that they were a people-first agency. And I can truly say, like, I've been there since May, and, like, they have held up that promise since I've been there. 
Um, so yeah, that is how I found that. <laughs> I was on an agency before Chewy, and it was going to be a fully remote position because it was based out in LA. And after, like, I think it was like eight or nine months, the world was kind of opening it up. And so I was kind of, I wanted to move to Boston and everything. So I wanted to start looking for, I guess, like more of a close position here. And I love dogs. So I saw that Chewy, like, had a position open on LinkedIn, and it just happened to be another media analyst because I was an analyst at the agency prior to this. So that's kind of how I ended up at Chewy, and it just fell in love because, again, it's a pet lover company. So <laughs> that's how I ended up there. Thank you for sharing. Kind of following up on that last question, um, I know a lot of college students are trying to figure out exactly what they want to be doing after college, and they're, it's kind of an unsure time. So. How did you say? How would you say that you figured out like where you wanted to go, what job you wanted to do, and if it's something that um, unexpected that you thought when you were still a student here? I didn't think I was going to be in broadcast TV. Um, I still feel like I don't even know what I want to do. I love what I'm doing right now, but I feel like marketing is so broad that you can really do anything with it. I thought I was going to end up in digital, and here I am, like, almost two years later, still in broadcast TV, so I don't really know. I mean, it's a wild world, I guess. <laughs> I'm five years out, and I feel the same way. Like, I left UNH, and I worked for a company in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, that made arts and crafts supplies. I had a paint line in Hobby Lobby. That's where my career started, and now I'm running paid social and spending, like, millions of brands' dollars on Facebook every month. <laughs> so I think that part of marketing is, again, this idea of agility. I think that marketing is such a broad umbrella, and there's nothing but opportunity. And it's really just like a test and learn situation. Like I took a job that was not the right fit for me. I just told you guys that. And it's like, okay, I learned I don't want to be here. Move on. And there's so many roles and so many things you can do. So don't be afraid to try something that feels right. And then don't be afraid to change your mind. Yeah, I think from my experience, I had joined Wayfair in a completely different department. And after about a year or so, I realized that wasn't the right fit for me and not what I wanted to do long term. So I think you, know, you, can, you can decide once you're there and, and going through the motions that maybe this isn't for me. And then Wayfair is great about internal mobility. So I was able to reach out to stakeholders to find out information and, and what was available on other teams to make that switch. So really being open and, and being clear and upfront about what you're looking for um, and, and knowing that it's okay to, to change your direction um, as long as it's what is aligns with your long-term goals. Yeah, I literally nothing to add. Like I had a very similar experience where in college I wanted something totally different than what I'm doing right now and it was just a matter of staying open. Um, keeping an open mind, yes, knowing when to, to pivot if something's not right for you, but just kind of following that meandering path and you'll eventually get where you are and then you can figure out where you want to go. Yeah, and I know Julie and Nicole, we were talking earlier about how a lot of people these days aren't really working, like our generation's not working 30-year jobs or working like two years here, two years here, because we're understanding what we deserve and what we want and we're not just going to like put up with what we don't deserve. That's a big thing that we realized. Yeah, no, totally. And it's like, I, my office closed during the pandemic, so I took a job being like, I'll go into the office some of the time, and it closed, and at first I was like, oh, I don't like this. And then I spent three weeks in San Diego in January and was still able to do my job, and I was like, wait, this is <laughs> sick. So I think that it's also just like kind of figuring that out, but like, yeah, our generation is able to do jobs so differently, and don't be shy about it. Your parents will tell you, oh my God, you're leaving your job. You've only been there for 12 months. At least that's what my mom said. It was only six. But anyways, it, it will be okay. Like, I promise it will work out. Yeah, they, for some reason, put it in our heads that if you are out of, like, leave a job too early, it, like, really looks bad. But if you have a reasoning, I feel like it's understandable. Like, if you're, like, in a toxic environment and you're not treated right, like, why wouldn't you stay? Exactly. And people are understanding of that. When I was interviewing at Tenuity, actually, my hiring manager said, why are you leaving? And I said, because I'm unhappy. <laughs> and she was like, cool, what makes you unhappy? And I told her what it was, and she said, great, you won't have any of those issues here. And I said, perfect. And that was, like, the end of the conversation. Exactly. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say 
I am so incredibly proud of all of you, and we all, we all are here at UNH, so thank you. But, I, but there's more questions. <laughs> On behalf of this panel, thank you for putting us up here. We wouldn't be up here without you, so. <laughs> any other, anyone have any other questions? I think we have one more question over here. Yeah, we do. Yeah, I think I think once you do find your fit or, or you're, you're really starting to progress in your career, you need to start becoming an advocate for yourself. So um, whether that's having conversations with your manager or your your external and, and kind of internal um, internal group of supporters to understand what are the next steps. How do I how do I whether it's expanding scope or getting to the next position advocate for yourself. Um, and again, going back to my earlier point, if it's not a position you want to be in long term, start researching what else is out there within the company. And then, if not within the company, moving externally. But yeah, definitely advocate for yourself. Yeah, and I think additionally to that, um, within the agency side of things or the digital side of things, I guess, typically the flow is like you start out in an analyst position, um, then you kind of move up a little bit to handle some strategy, then you get, I'm at this, the stage I'm going to talk about now where I'm like, mainly strategy, I'm like 50% hands on keyboard when like someone needs help. So for me, what comes next is to really like the bird's eye view and just like helping brands build their strategy. Um, something else that I will say about growth is like, at least in my situation, I feel really passionately about mentorship. So within my company, I actually just piloted a mentorship program where we built this whole network. So people who don't work together now get to meet twice a month and you can ask questions that you're too embarrassed or too shy to ask the people that you work with and that is part of what's helping me promote and nobody told me to do that nobody asked me to do that I just said hey I think that there's this gap I think that this is something that we should do so if you're in a position where you're looking to promote just kind of look around and see what you can be doing that's not already being done Well, I just want to say thank you again um, to Sean and all of our panelists for taking the time to come to today's event and share both your experience and insights into the marketing world with us. Um, many of us here are going to be in your shoes now, um, so that made today's conversation even more beneficial, and we are so um, pleased that we were able to do this in person again this year. Um, we are now going to transition to our reception, so please feel free to stay and join us in the Great Hall for networking, drinks, and appetizers. Thank you. Once again, thank you guys for coming here today. Uh, there is a slight delay on some of the beverages uh, for the networking event, but please feel free to go out there uh, and socialize while we wait for those. Thank you.